Senator Wong, are you seeking the call? Senator Wong. Uh, I uh, seek leave to make a statement concerning ministerial arrangements. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Wong. I thank, I thank the Senate and I advise changes to ministerial arrangements. Uh, Senator Gallagher will obviously be absent from question time today on account of ministerial business relating to budget. Yeah. Uh, in Senator Gallagher's absence, ministers will represent portfolios at question time in accordance with the letter circulated uh, to the president and party leaders and independent senators. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Birmingham. President, I seek leave to make a statement regarding shadow ministerial arrangements. Is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator Birmingham. I thank the Senate. President, I advise the Senate that Senator Nampajimpa Price has been appointed shadow minister for Indigenous Australians. Senator Patterson as shadow minister for Home Affairs. And Senator Little as shadow minister for Child Protection and the Prevention of Family Violence. And Senator Cash as shadow attorney general. And I seek leave to table the revised shadow ministry list and to have it incorporated into Hansard. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator thank you. Birmingham. We now move to question time, and I'm uh, calling Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Wong. Has the government modelled the impact of its decision to increase immigration by 715,000 people over the next two years on rental markets in Australia's capital cities? Uh, thank you, Senator Smith. Uh, Senator Wong. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, President, I thank Senator Smith for uh, the question, uh, and I will, uh, when I find the brief I, I was looking at before in relation to migration, I will respond directly on the nom that he identifies. But I, if I may, go to the rental point. Um, <clears throat> it is odd to get a question about uh, housing in a week where. The Coalition and the Greens are going to work together to prevent investment in housing supply. Because if, if the new coalition, because if Senator Smith were concerned, as his question suggests he is, about rental affordability, he is somebody who I think understands basic supply and demand, and he would understand <laughs> that if you increase supply, you put downward pressure on prices. So if one cares about uh, rental affordability. How do you square that away, Senator Smith? Uh, how do you square Order. that away uh, with your opposition to more investment in the very infrastructure or the, ver the very uh, capital investment that you say matters? Now, the reality is uh, uh, we have a higher net overseas migration, migration forecast uh, in 2022-23 to reflect a one-off catch-up from the pandemic and the return of international students. And I know those opposite recognise the importance of that service, export service to our economy and to the financial uh, and broader uh, position of our educational institutions. So I would have been surprised in fact, I have been surprised at Mr Dutton's position, which seems to suggest we don't want international students to return, which is, of course, an export earner for Australia, uh, but at the same time uh, uh, opposing uh, the Housing Thank you, Senator Australia Wong. Future uh, Fund. Senator Smith, first supplementary. President, a supplementary question. How does the government reconcile its plan for increased immigration with the comments made by the Reserve Bank of Australia in this month's statement on monetary policy that a shortfall in housing supply relative to strong demand from a rising population is expected to result in continued upward pressure on rents, adding to the inflation forecast. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Wong. Uh, well, I suppose the response to that might simply be, how do you reconcile your opposition to more investment in housing with the statement that you've just read out? I mean, they are, they, it is utterly inconsistent. But uh, I'll take, uh, because you know, Senator Smith and I you know, served here a long time together, I will, I will take the, the less political aspect of his question, uh, which, which goes to. <laughs> Which goes to, oh, sorry, if I've done, oh, no, now you're going to be in trouble, aren't you? I've, I've said that. Um, which goes to the inflation point, and it's, it is, it is uh, an important 
uh, balancing uh, acts that the government has had to take through the budget as we look at how is it that you invest in support for cost of living, given the cost of living pressures that Australians are facing, without adding to inflation, well, without uh, adding to inflation. Uh, and the, and the, uh, the Expenditure Senator Review Watt. Committee and the fi uh, Finance Minister and the Treasurer, uh, as well as the Prime Minister, who, uh, thank who you, Senator it, Watt. have been very focused Your on Your time that. has expired. Senator Watt, I am going to remind you it is incredibly disorderly to call out when you're walking down to the Senate, and I would further ask you to withdraw the comments that you made. Thank you. Senator uh, Smith, second supplementary. Thank you, President. <laughs> Isn't the government's decision to increase immigration to unprecedented levels just another example of the government's policies working against the Treasurer's statement that inflation remains the primary challenge in our economy? Thank you, Senator Dean Smith. Senator Wong. It is quite disappointing that the, those opposite who understand the backlog in terms of net overseas migration caused by the pandemic are going down this path. Uh, it is the case uh, that we are seeing return, the return of international students. It's an important sector. Uh, I would remind the Senate that population is still forecast to be cumulatively lower than pre-pandemic forecasts by June 2023 and 215,000 persons lower in June 2024. So, in fact, whilst the net overseas migration figure is higher, the population forecast is in fact lower uh, than was forecast previously. Uh, so I would counsel. Uh, obviously, we understand the importance of making sure we have a sensible debate on migration. We've seen where this has gone at other times in this country. And what I would urge those opposite to recognise is that investment in housing is one of the ways we ensure uh, that we assist uh, in the, the battle against rising cost of living, the, the Thank global you, inflation Wong. The time for and supply chain has constraints Senator have raised. Stewart. Thank you. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Can the minister update the Senate on how the government's budget will fix legacy issues Labor inherited from the Liberals and Nationals and address cost of living pressures? Thank you, Senator Stewart. Uh, uh, Senator Wong. Thank you, President. Uh, the Albanese government is committed to a stronger economy and a fairer society, and the budget will reflect that. Uh, we on this side have been working hard to clean up the mess left by Liberals and Nationals. They failed to manage the budget and they drove up debt. Tonight's budget will be a budget in the best Labor tradition, a budget focused on delivering cost of living relief now, including a $14.6 billion package of targeted relief for household energy relief, bill relief, cheaper medicines, expanding access to the parenting payment and more. Now, obviously, more, much more will be revealed tonight, but I can say that this budget will deliver it, be delivered in the most responsible way so that it will not drive up inflation. Mm -hmm. We've also worked to ensure that this budget invests in the future, in the future growth of our economy with cleaner and cheaper energy at the core of that strategy, in sharp contrast to uh, what those opposite, opposite delivered. Our budget is built on a foundation of responsible economic management, a stark contrast to those opposite. Right. Tonight's budget will include uh, billions of dollars cleaning up the mess left to us by the Liberals and the Nationals. You see, unlike those opposite, Labor is not prepared to leave vital government functions unfunded, including biosecurity, disaster management, management of radioactive waste, digital health and online safety. Unlike those opposite, we're not happy to leave national collecting institutions to crumble or ignore Liberals' chronic underinvestment in our national parks or flood warning infrastructure. And of course, this is for the, we had to address the previous government's failure to provision a single dollar for the Olympic and Paralympic Games. Not a single dollar. So I'm hoping the Queenslanders might actually cheer a government that's backing in Queensland when it comes to the Olympics Order. and Paralympic Games. And we, of course, are building on the $4.1 billion uh, in the October you, budget Wong, we had to spend to resolve legacy expired. Senator Stewart, first supplementary. Thank you. Can Minister Wong please explain how the government is working to provide targeted, responsible cost of living relief without adding to inflation? Senator Wong. Uh, I thank Senator Stewart for her supplementary. Uh, and I would say this, uh, this senator and all senators 
are very focused on cost of living relief for Australians in a way that is responsible and effective. So our priority is to provide cost of living relief without adding inflationary pressure to the economy. So we will include $14.6 billion in tonight's budget in responsible targeted cost of living relief. And it builds on and th those opposite might remember this, they build on an increase to award wages. An increase to award wages for aged care workers, improvements to paid parental leave and cheaper childcare. But uh, as the Treasurer has flagged, it will forecast a surplus for this year, a deliberate result of the Albanese government's responsible bottom line. Now, but unlike, the, unlike those opposite, we will, do, we will deal with this responsibly. We won't be wandering around like those opposite did with the back in black ma mugs. The back in black mugs. We will deal with this budget responsibly. Responsi Order. Order. Senator Wong. Senator Wong, please resume your seat. Order. Senator Stewart. Thank you. Can the minister provide further detail on, on Labor's continued responsible approach to budgeting, in contrast to the decade of waste and irresponsible spending from the Liberals and Nationals? Senator Wong. Well, uh, I would make this point that because those off opposite uh, seem to live in some sort of fantasy land where they think they were responsible. Uh, those opposite doubled the debt before the pandemic. Those opposite left Australians with a trillion dollars in debt, a trillion dollars in debt, and nothing to show for it. Order. We on this side, this government will make decisions to reduce uh, the. Oh, they Wong. don't like it, do they? Senator Wong. You don't like Senator it. Wong. It's very It's very upsetting Senator to know Wong. you're fiscally Please irresponsible. Yes, your Senator. Seat. Order. I'm waiting for silence, and I'll. Call the minister again, Senator Wong. Those opposite doubled the debt before the pandemic. They left us with a trillion dollars in debt, nothing to show for it. What we will see in tonight's budget uh, is more, uh, more, more, 17.8 billion dollars in spending reprioritised, building on the 22 billion dollars in savings and reprioritisation we identified in the October budget. Guess what their savings were in their last budget? Zero, zero. Uh, one thing I would also say, uh, one, of the, one of the improvement things driving the improvement to revenue is, of course, improvement in wages, and we all Thank know you, Senator those Wong. opposite are for a low for wage economy. Expired. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Wong. Minister, is it accurate that most working Australian families will receive no energy bill relief in this budget? but will still be hit with the costs of higher inflation and an increased tax bill caused by bracket creep. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Order on my right. Uh, Senator Wong. Uh, well, th thank you, uh, President, and I thank the Senator for her question. Uh, and I would make this point. Uh, obviously, details of the energy price relief plan uh, which required bilateral discussions with all states and territories will be, uh, re uh, will be demonstrated in some detail in tonight's budget. But it does seem strange, just like the housing question, that we get a set question from a coalition senator about energy price relief after they voted against That's it. That's right. You that? voted against it. We you did. voted against the plan that you're now asking questions about. You vote. Uh, yeah, oh, oh, it's because our policies weren't going to deliver, he says. Well, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? It's interesting, isn't it? You know, they come in here and they say, we're for energy price relief, sort of, but we're going to vote against it. And actually, we've got nothing else on the table to deliver it. There's only one party here, uh, one party in go of government that is absolutely clear about the responsibility and opportunity of government to deliver price relief to Australian families. We know that energy prices have risen less than they would have less than they would have if you had been in government uh, and those opposite irresponsibly voted against price relief uh, for Australian families. Uh, and we will ensure between now and the next election, every time you raise energy prices, we remind everybody who is listening that you voted against it. All of you, you voted against it. You voted against it and really, uh, you should go out to the Australian people and you Order. should apologise for your refusal to give some price Order. relief to families who are struggling with higher prices. 
as always, you know, those opposite still too focused on the ideology, not on practical outcomes, and their only response uh, to, to energy price increases was to try and uh, hide it you. before the last thank election. Thank you, Senator Wong. Order on my left. When you're asking a question and the minister responds, I expect there to be order and that I shouldn't have to call order three or four times to get order. I'm asking you to respect the Senate. Senator Hughes, first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Minister, how many of these same families who are ineligible for Labor's energy bill relief will pay more income tax in 22-23 as a result of bracket creep and the low and middle income tax offset coming to an end? Uh, order on my right. Senator what? Uh, Senator... You ended it. So, uh, uh, order on my right. Order. Order on both sides. Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, and I, I, I'm a little confused, and I have obviously been focused on Sudan and other issues. But um, is the senator asking a question about a tax offset that they ended? She is. Yeah, she I is. think so. I think so. For my, my recollection is the Lamaito was, in fact, uh, the ending of that was, in fact, flagged by your Correct. government. So if you're now going to fund that, I look forward to a budget reply which tells Australians how you will fund that. Well, you know, Senator Hughes, you're Senator Hughes, uh, you, you, are, you, are, you are asking a question about a policy. If your policy position is to fund that, I look forward to Senator, uh, Mr Dutton outlining his plan to fund that and which government services, which are parts of Medicare, he's not going to deliver uh, uh, in order to fund that. Uh, we are very focused in this budget on ensuring we provide responsible cost of living uh, assistance uh, to Australians. Now, obviously, you, you always, there is always more that you would do if you could. Thank you, Senator because... Wong. The time for answering has expired. Senator Hughes, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Minister, the Albanese government continues to promise energy bill relief for Australians. But as this latest revolution proves, it rarely delivers and most miss out. Isn't it true that the millions of Australians ineligible for this current package also have no hope of ever seeing Labor's promised $275 cut to their bills? Shame. Uh, Minister Wong. Uh, thank you, uh, President. Uh, well, Senator Hughes, uh, in my state of South Australia, uh, under your refusal to act uh, on energy policies, South Australians would have been paying $530 more. Wow. $530 more. Now, I, I realise you're not a South Australian senator, but I did see that. Uh, I did see that. I did see that figure, and I thought, well, there you go. That's the actual cost to South Australian families uh, of the opposition of the opposition, uh, the no of the coalition, who extraordinarily came in here. Uh, and voted against lower uh, price relief for Australians at a time where we know because of 10 years of your policies and because of what is happening with Russia's illegal and immoral invasion of Ukraine, uh, that energy prices uh, were, were going up. But you voted against it. South Australians uh, would have been $530 worse off if you had, not, if you had succeeded. Uh, thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Shoebridge. Oh, thank you, President. My question is to Minister Wong in her capacity as Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade. Minister, with the helpful ending of the quiet diplomacy strategy from both the Prime Minister and Opposition Leader last week in relation to the ongoing cruel detention of Australian journalist and WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange and the increasingly united cross-party call for his detention to end, can you please now state clearly on the record what you were doing to ensure Julian Assange is brought home. Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Minister Wong. Uh, well, I have already, and in fact, I saw it was interesting to me that someone, me repeating what I'd said at quite a number of press conferences, somehow was seen as a new thing. I, I have made it clear, the Prime Minister has made it clear, uh, that is an, enough is enough. We, we see no further purpose, uh, that we don't believe anything is to be served by Mr Assange's ongoing incarceration. And I know it might suit the Greens to not hear the fact that we have been saying that since we were elected and before, but we have. We have. 
Uh, now, uh, I'm also pleased that we did have the opportunity, my High Commissioner did have the opportunity to visit Mr Assange in Belmarsh Prison on the 4th of April. It is, of course, the first uh, consular visit uh, to Mr Assange since November 2019, and it was undertaken with his consent. Uh, it was uh, an opportunity, obviously, to check on his health and welfare, uh, which is consistent with uh, the assistance we provide to Australians who are detained. We will continue uh, at uh, all levels of, of government uh, to convey our expectations, certainly about his treatment, uh, and we will continue to express our view, privately and publicly, that that this case has dragged on for long enough and should be brought to a close. Um, now, Senator Shoebridge, uh, as you would know, these are not legal proceedings to which we are a party. Uh, uh, I know that there's been uh, some discussions with uh, parliamentary groups today. Um, the parliamentary group today, uh, I hope those were fruitful. We are seeking uh, to do what we can to resolve it, bearing in mind we are not a party to the legal proceedings which are currently un un unfought. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Shoebridge, first supplementary. Minister, the question is not what you can't do. The question is what you are doing. Julian Assange has now been held in brutal conditions in Belmarsh Prison for over four years, with a potential extradition to the US while the potential extradition is considered. You've spoken about our close relationship with the UK and US, USA before. What are you doing as minister to ensure our good friends let Julian come home? Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Senator Wong. Uh, again, what I would say is, as minister and as the prime minister, we have put our views clearly uh, to the United Kingdom and to the United States. Uh, but there's always a non sequitur in your question, and that is, what are we doing to ensure we cannot ensure? Um, and you might like to uh, yell about that, but just as I cannot ensure, and Senator Payne could not ensure, that people who are uh, you know, in, um, uh, dealing with the legal system of another country, well, that's a, that's a fact. Now, I do think it's gone on. It, no, well, hang on. I know you want to make, play politics with this. I want to say this to you. I think it has gone Senator on too long. Shoebridge. Yeah, I don't support what, what he did, but I think this has gone on too long. I do not believe, nor does the Australian government believe, that there is anything to be served by his ongoing car incarceration. And that view informs our engagement with uh, the two countries concerned. But we are not a party to the proceedings. Thank you, Senator Wong. Uh, Senator Shoebridge, before I ask you for your second supplementary, I'll mind you not to interject once you've asked your question. So, second supplementary, thank you. Thursday 4 May was World Press Freedom Day, and the Attorney General Mark Dreyfus on that day tweeted, the Albanese government believes a strong and independent media is vital to democracy and holding governments to account. Journalists should never face the prospect of being charged or even jailed just for doing their jobs. Do you accept, Minister, that Julian Assange is a journalist and should not be facing persecution for telling the truth and doing his job? Senator Wong. Uh, uh, I think Australia supports the freedom of the press as an uh, important principle in our democracy. Full stop. Uh, and in relation to Mr Assange, I would again say uh, we do not believe there is anything served by his ongoing incarceration, and we have put that view. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Polly. Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government. The Albanese Labor Government has committed to invest in infrastructure that is nationally significant and delivers for our communities. How is the government working to deliver an infrastructure pipeline that is sustainable, comprised of nationally significant project and aligns to market capacity? Senator Watt. Uh, thank you, Senator Polly. Uh, I really do appreciate that question from Senator Polly, who I know understands the importance uh, of infrastructure to local communities in her state of Tasmania. Uh, before I answer, though, can I also just take the opportunity to acknowledge in the gallery Alice Springs Mayor Matt Patterson. Uh, it, I've met with Mayor Patterson in Alice Springs, as I know many others have, and we welcome you to the chamber. Uh, as we all know, the previous government left the infrastructure investment pipeline in a total mess, just like the entire budget that we inherited. And geez, don't they hate being reminded of it. The infrastructure program under the coalition government was back, full of backed up projects that were announced without the support of states or territories, poorly scoped, 
underfunded and couldn't be delivered because there weren't the tradespeople to build them. And why? Order. Simply Order. to win votes. The infrastructure program of the coalition government was undeliverable and spiralling out of control, having blown out from 150 projects to almost 800. The previous government got addicted to press releases and neglected the hard work of actually building infrastructure. What do we remember about the last government? All announcement, no delivery. It was a government that made investment decisions on the basis of colour-coded spreadsheets, and even now they still boast about it. One of the things that separates our government from those opposite is that when we make a promise on infrastructure, you can actually believe it. Because as many Australians have observed, we now have a government of adults in charge. What a novel suggestion that is. What a change from the last rabble that we had, the Liberal Party unable to run a budget, running the budget into the ground, but with the National Party members uh, making wild promises and National Party Order. ministers running around the Order. countryside promising all sorts of infrastructure projects that they didn't fund, didn't have the tradespeople to deliver. Uh, the Labor government is going to do a much better job of that, and you'll see a lot more about that tonight. I'm looking forward to seeing you, the infrastructure Watt. program for our country. Uh, before I come to you, Senator Polly, Senator Hughes, I called you to order twice, and you ignored that. I would ask you to, to Senator, Senator Henderson. My apologies, Senator Hughes. Senator Henderson, I called you to order twice and you ignored that. I would ask you to respect the Senate. And my apologies to you again, Senator Hughes. Uh, Senator Polly. Senator Polly, first supplementary. After a decade of waste and rorts, the Albanese government is cleaning up the mess left by the Liberals and Nationals in the infrastructure portfolio. How is the government demonstrating the commitment to nation-building infrastructure and bringing certainty to the infrastructure sector? Uh, order. Before I call you Senator Watt, I am going to remind senators, particularly on my left, uh, that when the question is being asked, I expect you to be quiet. Senator Watt. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you again, Senator Polly. The Albanese government is, in, is committed to investing in projects that are truly nationally significant and deliver real benefits to Australians. After a decade of waste and roots, the Albanese government is getting on with the job of delivering actual projects, not just promises, actual projects that will benefit communities for years to come right across, the, right across Australia. We're getting on with the job of delivering important nation-building infrastructure, like the Bruce Highway upgrades from Cairns to Townsville to Rocky, uh, and even all the way down to the outskirts of Brisbane, uh, and the Coranda Range uh, Road in North Queensland as well, along with many others in Senator Polly's, Polly's home state of Tasmania. Uh, to get our infrastructure pipeline back on a stable footing, though, we've already announced a 90-day independent review of the infrastructure investment program that will ensure that we are investing in projects that are truly nationally significant to make sure that freight keeps moving, that people can get home safely and that connections between our cities and our regions are strong. Uh, Senator P uh, Polly, second supplementary. For a decade, the Liberals and Nationals used colour-coded spreadsheets and, poli and political motives to determine infrastructure investment. What has the government inherited from the coalition in the infrastructure pipeline, and how will the Albanese government clean up the mess left behind? Order. Great question. Senator Watt. Thank you, Senator Polly. And what a mess we did inherit in the infrastructure program. An infrastructure program uh, too full of colour codes in their spreadsheets to actually be delivered, and as I say, having blown out from 150 to almost 800 projects. Let's just remember a couple of the highlights of the Liberal and National Party's infrastructure program. Remember the inland rail, which we were promised would cost $9.3 billion, which has now blown out to approximately $31 billion, Order. with the potential for costs to rise even further. How about the urban congestion fund, full of imaginary car parks in marginal seats? Projects that were grossly underfunded and in some cases committed with la without land even being available. The former Treasurer, no longer with us, committed $260 million to remove a level crossing next to his own electorate without telling the state government that runs the train line. The funding was also hundreds of millions of dollars short of the actual funding required to do the job. We are adults. We are an adult government. We are going to have an infrastructure Thank program you, that can Watt, be delivered rather than mythical. Senator David Pocock. 
Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Wong. How much petroleum resource rent tax has been paid by LNG projects to date? Senator Wong. Thank you, uh, and thank you to Senator Pocock for the question. Uh, this is the advice I have to date, that um, uh, PRRT revenue predominantly relates to oil and gas produced in Bass Strait, and no offshore LNG project has paid PRRT yet. Uh, most offshore LNG projects are not expected to place, pay substantial amounts of PRRT before 2030, whilst earning significant revenues from Australia's gas resources. So the Treasury review, so the Gas Transfer Pricing Review, ha highlighted the shortcomings of the PRRT for the offshore in LNG industry and the need to adapt the rules for these types of projects. Uh, the measure that is contained in the budget and the pro that the Treasurer has announced is intended to address this problem and will require the offshore LNG industry to pay more tax sooner. It will bring forward PRRT payments from those projects expected uh, to pay and additional PRRT payments from those projects not expected to pay under current policy settings. So, in other words, from those who are currently under current settings likely to uh, uh, return uh, to governments and certain uh, tax receipts, uh, and though it, that will bring that, that payment forward, uh, but also um, it will ensure that some projects not current, under current settings, which would not pay under current settings, would pay some PRRT. Uh, it, the intention is to ensure a return to the Australian community from the gas resources even when there are low prices. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Pocock, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Thank you, Minister. Um, after company, pack, uh, company tax that is paid, does the government think that zero dollars in PRT is a fair return for Australians? And if it isn't, why are you just bringing forward the date they pay rather than actually ensuring that Australians are paid for our own gas that is being exported or sold back to us at export prices? Uh, Senator Wong. Well, I'll take that um, interjection because I think this is one of the problems with the debate here, that uh, there are people in this chamber who seem to believe that uh, the fact that we have a different policy position uh, is because somehow we corrupt, and I think that's really offensive. Actually, it's really offensive Senator because McKim. we on this side, Senator Wong, we on the. I'm oh, sorry, Wong. Senator Pocock. Fair enough. Please resume your seat, Senator Pocock. Um, Senator McKim will get his, his question at some stage. I'd, I'd really love an answer. To thank, you. thank you. I'll remind the minister of your question. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, look, the 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 view that the Treasurer has articulated is this is about ensuring a fairer return to the Australian people from the resources they own. It is also about providing certainty to industry and making sure Australia remains a, a reliable trade and investment partner. So there are a range of uh, policy objectives, which are all, I would argue, in the national interest, that in arriving at this position after substantial consultation that the government has to balance. Uh, and we've sought to do that. So I accept that if you were only thinking about Thank you, one Senator aspect Wong, the time of those, you might come up with a different... Senator Pocock, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Thank you, Thank you Minister. Um, given so many Australians are facing cost of living pressures and feeling increased climate impacts, how does the government justify increasing fossil fuel subsidies and not genuinely reforming the PRRT so that we are at least getting a return from the sale of our gas? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Uh, Minister Wong. Senator Pocock, I'm happy to have a discussion with you about some of those assertions because I don't believe them to be correct. Um, but you know, I accept there's a bit of political rhetoric. Uh, this government has been very clear about the importance of acting on climate. Uh, we have brought forward an ambitious policy on that. You will see uh, in this budget also the, the, our commitment uh, to the transition in our economy. Uh, you made a number of assertions there about uh, PRRT, which I don't accept. Uh, you know, we do have to. Uh, we have reformed this measure because we think uh, that is justified. 
Uh, I've explained to you the various policy uh, objectives that have to be balanced in that. Uh, but it is not the only thing we are doing in the energy space. We do, as a country, have to transition. We do, as a country, have to uh, uh, reform. We do, as a country, want to be a renewable energy superpower, and we are committed to ensuring we do all we can to deliver Thank that. Thank you, Minister Wong. Uh, Senator Davey. Thank you. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Emergency Management, uh, Senator Watt. Uh, Minister. The National Emergency Management Agency's website claims it has boots on the ground across Australia through the network of regional recovery support officers that help recovery and resilience in communities affected by disasters or drought. There are currently, according to the website, 57 regions throughout Australia with locally based regional support officers, and there is um, you know, uh, videos supporting the value of the local knowledge. Um, do you, as minister, or does the agency have any plans to relocate these locally based staff from regional areas into city centres or centralised hubs? Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Davey. Uh, I know very well uh, about the uh, great work that our RSOs, as we call them uh, in the NEMA, the National Emergency Management Agency, undertake, because I've met very many of them uh, right across the country. In fact, just on Friday, I think it was, I was in Tasmania uh, at AgFest, uh, where I also met some of the terrific RSOs that have been doing a great job, and I'd met them in the floods after Tasmania, as I have in many other places. Now, uh, my view is that we do need to retain a strong regional presence of those RSOs. I know there has been some discussion internally within the National Emergency Management Agency, uh, but the agency and its, its executive are very clear uh, that my view is, as minister is that uh, the RSOs do put, perform an important role, including in regional areas. Um, they are a, an important conduit of information back to head office, uh, and that's one of the reasons why I support their ongoing use. Obviously, there are decisions to be made by the National Emergency Management Agency as to how they use their resources, uh, and that work will go on. Uh, but as I say, I've made it very clear that on a personal level as minister, I think that it is important that we retain a, a, re a regional presence amongst those RSOs. Uh, but while I'm on my feet, I might also mention um, that the entire issue of resourcing of the National Emergency Management Agency has been a difficult one in the run-up to this budget, because this is yet another uh, area of government where we have inherited funding cliffs. And in fact, the former coalition government cared so much about having RSOs and a regional presence and support for our emergency management agency, that they were on track to cut funding to the National Emergency Management Agency by around 25 to 30 per cent. That's how much they cared about supporting our RSOs and our agency, uh, and I can assure people uh, that this government takes Thank these you. issues much more seriously. Uh, Senator Watt, the time has expired. Senator Davey, first supplementary. Thank you. And I'm very interested that you uh, believe in the need to retain a regional presence. Can you then explain why several uh, of my colleagues have been contacted by RSOs in their regions, including myself, um, to, uh, with, by RSOs who have been told that they will be relocated to city-based centres or centralised hubs within 12 months. Is there any truth in their concerns? Thank you, Senator Davey. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Davey. Well, as I say, uh, my personal view has been communicated very clearly uh, to the National Emergency Management Agency that I think it is vital that we retain a regional presence of these uh, support recovery support officers, uh, because that is where many of the, re the disasters that we've seen over the last couple of years has occurred, has been in our regions, and we want to make sure that we do have people on the ground. As I say, there is work to be done by NEMA about how best to allocate its resources. And one of the reasons they've been forced to do this is because of the funding cuts that were on track to happen as a result of the budget that we inherited from the former 
the government. So I do find it a little hard uh, to listen to National Party uh, senators who all of a sudden are very concerned about resourcing for the National Emergency Management Agency when one of their own was the minister who delivered a budget that was going to cut funding to the National Emergency Management Agency by 25 to 30 per cent. We support regional Australians. We support urban Australians going through disasters. We're not about cutting uh, funding you, like Senator you Watt. like did. The time for answering has expired. Senator Davies, second supplementary. So, very briefly, very briefly, Minister, you have said it's your personal view that RSOs should stay in the regions. Will you be having a conversation with the CEO of NEMA to reflect on him your personal view? to ensure that regional support officers stay in the regions and aren't re-centralised hundreds of kilometres away from where they are needed and valued. Senator Watt. Well, I've already said in my first answer and my second answer that I've communicated my view about this, and that includes to the Coordinator General of the National Emergency Management Agency, Mr Brendan Moon, someone we hired with an incredible track record in emergency management to replace another individual called Mr Shane Stone. Uh, and Brendan Moon has been doing an outstanding job as the head of the National Emergency Management Agency. Now, uh, uh, now unlike the former Watt, government— Senator Watt, please resume your seat. Uh, I'm waiting for order on my left, Senator Davey. Of order, I mean that was highly disrespectful to a former commissioner, maybe not a member of this parliament, but I think we still need to show respect. Uh, order, order. I did not hear any particular comments, um, so I'm going to ask. Senator Watt to continue. Thank you, President. As I, as I, I invite you to have a look at the Hansard, where I said that Mr Moon replaced another individual by the name of Mr Shane Stone. Uh, so I'm not sure what's, in, what's offensive about that. Is it uh, individual, the name? I'm not quite sure. But anyway, this government has demonstrated from day one that we take the issues around disaster management far more seriously than ever happened under the former government. We actually showed up. We actually turned up and delivered support to people. We actually cooperated with the states rather than had fights with them. Order and on my left. we are taking Order. seriously the needs of funding for the National Emergency Management Agency, unlike a government that was on track to cut funding by 25 to 30 per cent. Thank you, Senator Watt. Uh, Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Madam President. My question is for the Minister representing the Minister for Defence. I refer to the government's recently announced retention bonus for ADF personnel that have just completed their return of service obligations or initial mandatory period of service four years. I draw the minister's attention to the numerous bonuses offered by both Liberal and Labor governments over the last 25 years. These include retention bonuses for Army specialists, bonuses and increased pay for submariners, and category retention bonuses for the RAF. Despite all this, the ADF is still struggling to attract and retain personnel. Why will this bonus system work when all others have failed? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Wong. Th thank you, President. I, I thank Senator Lambie for the question and acknowledge her, her many years of contribution uh, both in this place and beyond in relation to matters, the matters associated with defence and, in particular, her deep concern always for members of the ADF, including veterans. Uh, and I, she is right to point out that the, uh, the ADF uh, has, under governments of both political persuasion, uh, not had uh, um, the, the not been able to recruit and retain at the level that we seek. She's right, uh, and I don't pretend that uh, there is an easy answer to that. Uh, uh, and the government has been seized of this issue. Uh, there, was, there has been, um, uh, in the context of, obviously there's been a lot of work on the DSR, uh, as well as AUKUS, and in the context of the budget, we're very focused on trying to work through how it is we might deal with some of these recruitment and retention issues. Um, uh, we, we note the previous government made some very uh, substantial announcements about increases to the ADF, ADF but we're not on a pathway to deliver it. And we, we are looking uh, at a range of ways in which we might seek to do that. So I don't come in here, Senator Lambie, and tell you that somehow magically uh, all of those challenges associated with recruitment and retention will be resolved by one policy only. I suspect it won't be. Uh, I think it will assist, uh, but I think more needs to be done. And I'd make 
the broader point that it's not just an issue for the ADF. Uh, obviously, uh, we are under. You know, there's a there's a lot of sectors of the economy where we have um, a shortage of, of people willing to uh, work in those uh, you know, where we have labour shortages. We have a lot of sectors of the economy uh, where skilled staff are hard to both attract and Thank retain. Thank you, Senator Wong. Uh, and the Senator ADF Lambie. Uh, Senator Wong, time for answering has expired. Senator Lambie, first supplement. Thank you, Madam President. This bonus appears to be available only to personnel who have recently completed their return of service obligations or their initial mandatory period of service for four years. This means, in a practical sense, this will only be offered to the most junior ranks across the military. This will be a slap in the face to, the, to a junior leaders like corporals and sergeants and their colleagues in the Navy and the RAF who are attractive, attractive employees to civilian organisations. These are the ones you need to retain. They do, why doesn't the government want to keep these junior leaders in uh, our thank military? Thank you, Senator Lambie. The time has expired. Senator Wong. Thank you. Um, uh, Senator Lambie, in the time while uh, I was seeking to answer your first question, I have been provided with a little more information, and I might provide you with that. Um, as part of this year's budget, the, the government is announcing funding of an ADF continuation bonus. Um, the advice is that this is critical to influencing career decisions when the member is approaching their first opportunity to make a decision to stay or leave uh, the Australian Defence Force. Um, uh, we uh, obviously have been, as I said, uh, considering uh, a number of uh, the recommendations in the DSR. Uh, there were four recommendations relating to recruitment and retention, uh, and the government is developing options uh, uh, to respond to each of those four recommendations. The, the bonus that we are discussing was the immediate response of the DSR um, in, order to, uh, demonstrate, in order to continue to invest in uh, the growth and you, retention Senator of a highly this skilled defence workforce. Thank you, Senator Wong. has expired. Senator Lambie, second supplementary. Thank you. I'm not sure who's writing the policies, but they got it completely wrong. This bonus is reported to be available to just 3,500 defence personnel out of some 60,000 over three years. That's just over 1,000 per year. Defence reported in its 2021-22 annual report that about 11 per cent of its personnel, some 6,500 left the military that year. Why is the government offering a retention bonus to so few of our men and women in the ADF when the problem is so much greater than just a few thousand? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, Senator Lambie. I think in my first question I did uh, acknowledge that the problem is greater than, uh, one me than uh, the capacity of one measure to respond. And, uh, as I said, the DSR did contain a number of recommendations in relation to recruitment and retention. We will work through them and our defence is, will provide to government options for them. However, the immediate response was this, what's been described as a continuation bonus. I'm advised the eligibility for the bonus includes permanency, uh, nearing completion of the initial minimum period of service, having completed or will complete a minimum four years of service, agreeing to recommit to three years of full-time service and not all already in receipt of another bonus for the same commitment reason. Uh, the, uh, I think the Senator's response is uh, why is the uh, recruitment? Uh, why is this continuation bonus uh, narrowly cast? Uh, it is for the reasons that I identified in my previous answer. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Social Services, Senator Farrell. Can the minister representing the Minister for Social Services outline how the Albanese government is delivering on its commitments in the budget? to deliver cost of living relief where it can. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, President. Uh, and can I thank uh, Senator O'Neill for her ongoing interest in uh, pushing down the uh, cost of living, particularly for uh, constituents in her great state of New South Wales. And the centrepiece of the budget we hand down tonight will be a $14.6 billion cost of living relief package that is calibrated in a way that doesn't add to inflation. Oh, yeah. Our economic plan has three parts, relief, repair and restraint. I'll repeat that for Senator Birmingham's <coughs> benefit, relief, repair and restraint. This includes cost of living relief where it's affordable and responsible, and it also focuses on repairing uh, of our uh, supply chains. 
We need to show spending restraint to ensure we're getting genuine value for money from investments in our economy and our people so that we can clean up the mess left behind this lot over here. We have carefully cal calibrated and designed this budget so that it takes pressure off the cost of living rather than adds to it. This will be a budget in the best of Labor tradition. Help, help, help. I'll repeat that. I'll repeat that. This will be a budget in the best Labor tradition. Help for, a vul for vulnerable Australians with cost of living pressures. An eye on the future and responsible economic management. Our aim throughout, whether it's cost of living package, our broader investment in energy and other efforts to grow the economy, is to make sure that this budget is part of the solution to high inflation and cost of living pressures, not adding to the problem. It's important that as a government we focus on every policy lever available to us to tackle the pressures that are affecting more Australians' ability to make ends meet. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Senator O'Neill, first supplementary. Thank you, uh, Senator Farrell, for that fulsome um, response, and I'm sure it gives hope to the people of Australia. Uh, Senator, what measures has the government already taken in the social services portfolio to deliver cost of living relief? Senator Farrell. Thank you, President. Once again, thank uh, Senator. Uh, Senator, Senator, well, I, 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 I'm trying to be doing that. I'm disappointed you don't think I am, Senator Mackenzie. As, as a government, as a government, of course, we've been delivering on our commitment to address cost of living relief. We're delivering cheaper medicines and childcare. This will make a huge difference to the cost parents face in accessing quality care for their children. Uh, we've also announced a $64 million commitment for place-based partnerships to tackle uh, entrenched uh, disadvantage. This will extend to Stronger Places, Stronger People initiative in the existing 10 communities and enhance shared decision-making and local solutions in six of these communities. Yesterday, the Prime Minister announced changes to the parenting payment single budget measure that will lift both eligibility to parents with children up to 14 years of age and Thank lift you, the Senator payment Farrell. value the by $176 a night. Senator O'Neill, second supplementary. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, President. How is the government working to address ongoing concerns about cost of living beyond the immediate budget? Senator Farrell. <coughs> thank you, President, and thank uh, um, Senator uh, O'Neill for her second uh, supplementary question. This government will make substantial investments through the budget this year to provide cost of living relief and meaningful improvements to services like Medicare and cheaper childcare and the single parents uh, we know <coughs> there are pockets of disadvantage right around Australia and communities where people continue to struggle to get ahead. These measures will provide structural household budget relief once legislated. I remind the Senate that we've also established an expert economic inclusion advisory committee uh, and ask them to give us advice on boosting economic inclusion and tackling disadvantage. And I acknowledge that uh, Senator Pocock, uh, in his advocacy and work alongside the government in establishing this committee. Addressing cost of living pressures is consistent with what we said we would do before the election, what Labor governments always do. When the Liberal National Party talk about cost of living pressures, we know it's been tough because Australians are paying the thank price. Thank you, Senator Farrell. The time for answering has expired. Senator Dunham. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Wong, and I refer the Minister to the Albanese government's $240 million commitment to a new stadium to be built on Hobart's waterfront. And I ask and refer the Minister to Tasmanian Labor leader Rebecca White's question in Parliament today, the Tasmanian Parliament, about whether the federal government will be excising from GST calculations this commitment from the federal government. Will you, Minister, guarantee that this will not impact on Tasmania's share of the GST? Thank you, Senator Dunham. Minister Wong. I, thank you. Uh, I have learnt a lot from um, Senator um, Dunham across the chamber about Tasmanian politics. Yeah. Because he's explained to me, and as this question really goes to, that 
He's from the Tasmanian Liberal Party, but he doesn't support the Tasmanian Liberal government on the stadium. But Labor supports the Tasmanian Liberal government, except Senator Colbeck does support the Tasmanian Liberal government. So it's an interesting situation. Uh, Senator Walt, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Dunningham. So uh, obviously, President, on relevance, uh, Senator Wong's talking about all sorts of political things, not what matters to Tasmanians, and that's our GST share. It's Order. serious. Order on my left and right. Uh, Senator Dunningham, your question did go to uh, a question asked in the state parliament by another party, so I think Senator Wong is entirely within uh, the confines of your question. And if she doesn't get, uh, if she continues to answer the question, if she doesn't, I'll draw her to the question. Thank you, uh, Senator Wong. Uh, uh, well. Um, <laughs> Uh, thank you, uh, Senator. Uh, uh, what I would say is, uh, obviously, we are investing in Tasmania, but not only uh, in the stadium, but in health, housing, and infrastructure. Uh, we are, uh, for example, we announced recently an additional Medi Medicare urgent care clinic, taking the number of Medicare urgent care clinics to be established from uh, in the state Senator to four. Rustin. We've provided funding for two shepherd centres in Tassie, one in Hobart and one in Launceston, and we're investing in, in key infrastructure. Uh, I, I, am, I, I don't, unlike Senator Dunham, I don't, I'm afraid to say I don't watch the Tasmanian Parliament. Sorry. Uh, and I have a lot of regard for, for um, uh, Ms White, uh, but I, I don't know what the question was, but I certainly will take on... Take on Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Birmingham. But, but, but President, uh, on a point of order, because Senator Dunningham wasn't asking Senator Wong to, uh, to have some sort of uh, powers of knowledge as to what was happening in the Tasmanian parliament. He referenced that, but he asked a very specific question as to whether the minister would guarantee that the funding of the stadium in Tasmania would not impact on Tasmania's GST share. Minister Wong is representing the Treasurer in this place. It's a question for the Commonwealth Treasurer, quite appropriately, and one that Minister Wong should be able to uh, fairly directly address. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. I will draw uh, that part of the question to Senator Wong's attention. Lecture from Senator Birmingham about directly addressing questions. <laughs> anyway, we all remembered. All running a budget. That's true. Uh, uh, we all remember that. Uh, GST payments, Order. as you know, Order. Senator. Uh, uh, are allocated in, in accordance with a formula, uh, uh, and uh, that there is no change that I understand either the coalition or the Labor government has proposed to the way in which GST allocations are being made. Um, uh, but well, well, I will I will get what information I can on the specifics of a question asked by a Labor. Uh, person in the state uh, thank Parliament you, Senator of Tasmania Wong. The time to for assist answering you, has expired. Dunham. Senator Dunningham, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Well, uh, health was mentioned in the primary question, so I again refer to Labor's $240 million commitment to a waterfront stadium, and I ask, can the minister guarantee that in tonight's federal budget uh, that it will also be included funding for a desperately needed permanent full-time GP service for Tasmania's Central Highlands community? Uh, thank you, Senator Dunningham. Senator Wong. Uh, well, I, I thank you. I, I have already indicated that we have recently announced additional Medicare urgent care clinic for Tasmania, which will take uh, the number uh, established in the state to four, Devonport, Launceston and two in Hobart. Uh, I would make the point that uh, it is those of us on this side uh, in government and in opposition which has uh, always Wong, supported please Medicare, resume your seat. unlike you. Senator Wong, please resume your seat. Senator Dunham. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, just again on relevance, I asked a very specific question, not about urgent care clinics or about Medicare. I asked about GP services specifically for the Tasmanian Central Highlands community, and I haven't had a guarantee yet. Uh, I do think uh, Senator Wong is being relevant, but I will draw her to uh, Senator Rustin. I would remind you to act respectively and not call out and interject when I am answering a point of order. Um, but I will remind her to the specifics of uh, the Highlands region. Thank you. Pen well, actually, Senator I did Wong. answer the question because I said, you know, obviously these, the, these are, if, the, if I'm being asked a question about tonight's budget, the Senator will have to wait till the budget is announced. But uh, I, would, I would also make the point, and it is... Order. 
Uh, I would. I'll hold you to that. I, I would. Uh, I bet you that won't happen. Um, I, I would make this point. <laughs> I'm trying to finish the sentence here. Uh, the, the senator raises Medicare. Well, we know who built Medicare. That's right. We know who's always supported Medicare. Uh, thank you, we senator know who's Wong. failed, to, time failed to fund Medicare. Has it's not those. Senator Dunham, second supplementary. President, thank you. No guarantee on GST, no guarantee on GP services for Central Highlands. Can the minister confirm that in last year's Labor budget? $248.6 million was ripped out of Tasmanian road projects, and yet in this year's budget the government has found $240 million for the Hobart Stadium. Given Labor took money from road projects in a state where we have the worst road death toll in the country to fund a stadium, doesn't this show how out of touch with Tasmania's priorities Labor really is? Uh, thank you, Senator Dunham. Order. Order. Order across the chamber. Order across the chamber. Uh, Minister Wong. Thank you. The advice I have was, is that as part of the, the uh, government's 22-23 October projects, no, no projects, sorry, 22-23 October budget, no projects in Tasmania were cancelled or had funding reduced. The IIP also provided for more than $230 million over oh, 10 Senator years what? for smaller— uh, Senator Wong, sorry, please be... resume your seat. Uh, Senator Wong, please resume your seat. Senator McKenzie. Uh, point of order on the advice that uh, Senator oh, Wong— Senator McKenzie, that is not a point on of relevance. order. On relevance? Uh, the minister is being relevant. relevant. Thank you. Please resume your seat. Minister Wong. I know the truth hurts sometimes, Senator McKenzie. Uh, the statement that the senator made I don't think is correct. <coughs> Uh, and I would say this, in terms of the needs of Tasmania, I think the assertion that this senator is making is he understands them better than Senator Colbeck and his Liberal Premier. Uh, and with that, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Ah, thank you. Um, uh, senators, I would ask if you're leaving the chamber to do so quietly, and I'm giving the call to Senator Thorpe. Thank you, President. I refer to the matter in which the President made a statement on Thursday 30th of March 2023. I was not in the chamber when the statement was made by the President and Senator Hughes withdrew, withdrew her remarks. In order to maintain the dignity of the chamber, I withdraw. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. And just before we go to taking note, I would like to thank both uh, Senators Hughes and Thorpe for the gracious way in which they have withdrawn their those comments, and I would remind all senators to recheck the comments that I made on that day and to act in a respectful way. Thank you. Uh, are you doing taking note? Oh, okay. Senator Rustin. Um, pursuant to Standing Order 74, number five, I seek an explanation from the minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Minister Farrell, as to why answers to Senate estimates questions on notice numbers. Triple uh, 00035, 00037, 00039, 00051, 00053, 00064, 00065, 00066, 00075, 000106, 00517, 00530, 00533. 00535, 00536, 00537, 00538, 00539, 00540, 00543, 00547, 00549, 00550, 00554, 00561, 00562, 00566, 00609, 00610, 00611, 00645, and 00647. Why they have not been provided? Minister. Senator Rustin for her question. The uh, most recent Senate estimates for the uh, health and aged care portfolio were held on the 16th of February. Coming out of those hearings, there were 981 questions on notice directed to uh, this portfolio. Answers have been tabled for 645 of these questions, uh, and that uh, represents around two thirds of the questions uh, that have been answered. More are expected to uh, be tabled very shortly. 
There are um, uh, 336 uh, questions on notice uh, that um, uh, are outstanding, and these will be tabled in due course. Senator Rustin. Oh, it's, no, I gave the call to Senator Rustin. Hmm. Hmm? I, oh, I move that the Senate take note of the explanation provided by the Minister. Just before I give you the call, Senator Farrell, did you want to by leave add anything other information? Okay. No. Kennedy no, no, I'm not denying, Senator Rustin. Yeah. Uh, Senator Farrell was indicating that he may have further information to deliver to the chamber. Um, I, I did actually oh, stand sorry. first before Senator Rustin. I had a statement. I had a statement that I was going to read. Uh, I was simply uh, indicating that I wished to read that statement. However, I will defer to Senator Rustin. So, Senator Rustin, you have the call. You've moved the motion. Take note. Please proceed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, obviously, we will all remain with great interest in the statement that Senator Farrell was going to make about the fact that we have these overdue questions um, from the supplementary budget estimates 22-23. Um, and you know, these are questions that were very serious questions asked of this government in relation to two of the most important portfolios before government, that of health and aged care. Um, and you know, it's pretty extraordinary that you know a government who went to the election. Um, saying that it wanted to be elected on a, on, a, on a platform of transparency, and yet here we are with these really important questions remaining unanswered. This is, these questions are not a couple of days late, Senator Farrell. They're not a couple of days late. They're not a couple of weeks late. They're not a couple of months late. They are really, really late. In fact, um, you know, as we go into the next round of estimates, you know, we could quite easily see in the very near future, if you don't actually provide these answers, that we'll have three lots of estimates with um, questions all outstanding at the same time. So, you know, to call yourself a transparent government would have to be the greatest contradiction in terms I have ever heard. You are opaque. Um, but this is, this is the kind of track record that we're starting to see from this government in relation to their ability to actually provide the transparency that they promised Australians that they would. Um, and we've seen it through so many mechanisms by which they've addressed this chamber. And I draw to the attention an extremely, extremely distressing track record that is is and a pattern of play that's starting to emerge. And it's in relation to the inability to provide any details whatsoever um, about legislation and the mechanisms that sit behind legislation when they introduce them into parliament. We see headline after headline after headline. We see legislative um, instrument after legislation after legislation, all of which with the details completely absent. And they're expecting us in here to do our job. So I would say, actually, to those that sit not on the government benches, although sometimes I wonder whether the Greens actually are sitting on the government benches, do your job. Do your job and make sure you hold this government to account about the transparency and the detail around what they're doing. Stop letting legislation through this place when the details of that legislation are all going to be contained in subordinate legislation where they do not give us any detail of. So, you know, in, in, today we are go, uh, um, uh, debating uh, the, the, um, the Housing Australia Future Fund legislation, but we don't have the investment mandate details. So I would say to those in this chamber, please think very seriously before you let this government push things through completely opaquely, give you no detail because they just don't want you to know. And I think you know, human nature would always tell you when somebody is actually hiding things from you, it's usually because they've got something to hide. Um, so here we are, um, you know, six months later, and I still don't have answers to questions that we asked in October. Um, and the thing that is probably most distressing is the impact of the lack of this information is actually having more broadly in the wider community. Uh, and I draw yourself, uh, draw the chamber's attention, particularly to the crisis that we're seeing in aged care at the moment, where we know. Um, that some pretty ill-considered, opaque, detailless legislation was shoved through this place. And shame on those who supported the government at the other end of the chamber after we gave you a very clear and cogent reason why you shouldn't be letting this legislation be shoved through. Um, we are now seeing aged care facilities closed down as a result of the fact that this legislation was pushed through here with no possible ability for it ever to be able to be delivered. I mean, the, the Royal Commission into Aged Care said that 24-7 nurses 
uh, should be uh, put in place in our aged care facilities around Australia by 2024. You've also got to remember that that recommendation was made before COVID and before we had the crisis in healthcare workers that we're seeing at the moment. So despite the fact that the Royal Commission said 2024, despite the fact of the changing landscape in relation to our care workforce, this government, with the support of those down the other end, forced through a piece of legislation that has now seen many nursing homes closed across Australia, which means older Australians, particularly those that live in rural and regional Australia, have been forced out of a place that they call home and often have to move many, many, many miles away from where they were living, away from their families, away from their community, away from their loved ones, just because you guys didn't do your job and make these guys be more transparent about the promises that they have made. Um, as we stand here today, you know, we heard um, a conversation during question time in relation to urgent care clinics. These were promised that there would be 50 urgent care clinics in place by the 30th of June this year. Um, we still don't know where most of these urgent care clinics are going to be, um, despite the, the few in Tasmania. But despite knowing where a few of them are going to be, we still don't know. Is there going to be one additional consultation? Is one more person going to be able to get into a doctor? Is one more person going to be able to get better access, cheaper access or easier access in relation to primary care as a result of these clinics? Well, the answer simply has to be no, because this government has done nothing at all about the crisis that's before us right now, which is the workforce crisis. We do not have enough workers in our healthcare system at the moment because all they're doing is running around making headline promises that don't address the fundamental underlying problem that is before us. So we're now two weeks away from the 12-month anniversary of the election of this Albanese Labor government. And I think it is really quite extraordinary that despite going to the election promising that they were going to strengthen Medicare, going to the election with a catch cry, it's never been harder or more expensive to see a doctor. And we sit here on the eve of 12 months, we sit here today um, with not, uh, not a lot of hope that in the budget tonight there are going to be any measures that actually put in place the guarantee that they made to the Australian public about the health care system, about the aged care system. They are just simply not delivering. And we also know, I mean, the minister himself, the minister himself, Mark Butler, actually labelled the GP workforce crisis as terrifying. Well, it can't be that terrifying because we seem to have a lack of urgency, a lack of transparency about where they are going to find the unmet demand to backfill into this sector so that this terrifying situation in the minister's words, is addressed. And I also want to put on the record how disgusting it is that this government seems to believe that the sacrificing of rural, regional and remote Australia is an acceptable thing to do to mend their budget. Every single action we've seen taken so far has a perverse additional adverse impact on rural regional Australia. You know, the irresponsible and reckless changes to the distribution priority areas, the shoving of our skilled regional visas to the bottom of the processing pile, and uh, we now continue to see in the measures that are in this budget, uh, many of them will have a much, much more significant impact in rural, regional and remote Australia than they will in the capital cities. But this government just does not seem to care. Um, so, you come in here, you ask us to pass legislation, you refuse to answer questions, you refuse to give us detail about that legislation. So I would say uh, to the crossbench, to the Greens, do your job and make sure that you demand the information that I think every Australian expects us to know before we make the important decisions that are likely to impact on people's lives and livelihoods and wellbeing. So to my point in relation to aged care, one of the questions on notice that has still not been answered is how many aged care homes have closed in the last six months, where were they located and has this been broken down into modified Monash areas? And can the department provide a list of the providers um, that are likely to close? For some reason we can't provide that information. So the question must be, does the government not have this information? 
Is the government not tracking the potential impact of a decision that they have made, uh, one that has such extraordinary impacting, um, impacts on older Australians? Do they not know or are they just not wanting to tell us how many aged care homes have closed? Uh, in the case of mental health, uh, one of the questions asks, has the department been contacted by psychologists or mental health professionals since the decision to revert from 20 Medicare subsidised mental health sessions on 30 December 2022? Has the department been contacted by individuals since that decision uh, in seeking to have the decision to revert to 20 Medicare sessions? Has the minister's office been contacted by psychologists or mental health professionals uh, since the decision was made um, in, in uh, health sessions in 2022? Um, and did the department provide advice to the government on the risks associated uh, with the Better Access Initiative reverting to 10 sessions? What was that advice? Is the department aware of reports that 70 per cent of general practitioners say mental health is a top three priority reason why patients attend their practice? And can the department confirm whether they briefed health ministers on the increase in suicide rates uh, and, uh, uh, and had the minister consulted with suicide um, Prevention Australia, Mental Health Australia, the two peak bodies, before they made their decision to slash these really important mental health supports um, in half. Uh, they haven't answered those questions. And when you consider um, that right now we know um, from uh, peak body research that the most impactful thing that is impacting on Australians' lives uh, and their mental health right now is cost of living. We know um, Lifeline has reported an 80 per cent rise in the number of calls in relation to cost of living pressures. Headspace's recent survey, uh, national survey has identified the cost of living as one of the top three issues facing young Australians. And a recent uh, reach out survey found that more than 50 per cent of young people in Australia are stressed out by the cost of living. Now, there would be, uh, you would have to be blind not to realise that cost of living is the number one issue facing our country at the moment with the rampant homegrown Albanese government inflation eating into people's um, quality uh, of life. And so at a time when that is, uh, that is happening, when there's some serious questions to be asked in relation to decisions by this government to put in place um, a program um, in, uh, or to cut slash in half a program that supported mental health supports, uh, at a time when we know that cost of living is having a massive impact on people's mental health, this government refuses to answer even the most basic of questions about what was the basis that sat behind their decision to slash these particular programs when they happened. Um, another question that is before us at the moment uh, that we still have not had answered is, you know, what is the current unmet need for GPs? How many vacant places and where are those vacant places are in relation to the modified Monash categories? Can the department provide a modified Monash uh, model map highlighting areas where GP shortages are most significant? And what new measures has the government put in place to increase the supply and distribution of GPs across the country? How many international medical graduates have moved from MM5 to MM7 areas um, to MM5 and below? since the decision was made to change the distribution priority areas. Now, as I said, the minister has been out there and saying this is the most you know, like terrifying crisis that's before the nation. Um, he made a promise to the Australian public that he was going to fix this in coming into government, and yet a really, really fundamental set of questions that go to the very nature of the impact of these measures on rural, regional and remote Australia remain unanswered as we stand here today, months and months after they were asked. So I think there is clearly a track record that is starting to, and a, and a pattern of behaviour that is starting to emerge here, that suggests that this government has got no intention whatsoever of caring about the real delivery of those headline promises they made to Australians when they came in, uh, when they were up for election. They're quite happy to make the headlines uh, and go out there and often headlines sound good. I mean, who wouldn't think strengthening Medicare was a good idea? Who wouldn't think putting the care back into aged care was a good idea? But they're just headlines unless you put in place the real initiatives that are going to actually make a difference. 
and they're not much really worth the paper they're written on if you are not prepared to provide the details around how you're going to go about that so Australians can actually see how these things are happening. And we're already starting to see the wheels fall off, as we've seen with the aged care promises. The wheels are falling off because older Australians are being pushed out of their aged care homes, places that they've lived often for many years, simply because this government was so pig-headed around insisting the 24-7 nurse requirement was in place almost without exception or exemption, um, and we're now starting to see the consequences of this uh, announcement that obviously was something that we all would have aspired to see, that the older Australians get the care that they deserve and they warrant in their old age. But shoving them out of their homes simply because you've put in place a requirement for an action that was never deliverable, I think is one of the most despicable things that a government could do. You are more interested in the headline delivery of a promise that you made at the election than actually watching the circumstances as they unfolded on the ground and realise that your actions were actually going to have terrible detrimental impacts on older Australians. And instead of helping older Australians, you've made their lives worse. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. Um, I take note of the motion moved by Senator Rustin, uh, and I do so in um, uh, general terms, because what is becoming clearer and clearer when you look at the list of questions that remain unanswered by the government is that um, that list is getting longer and longer day by day and across portfolios. Now, I know when you have a change of government and ministers are trying to get their feet under the desk and get across their portfolios and their briefs, department uh, personnel might be changing, that it's hard to keep up with all of the um, demands of uh, the chamber uh, demanding information. Um, however, um, we are now seeing uh, the second budget being handed down by this government today, uh, and there is just no excuse for ministers and departments to hold back basic information that this Senate has voted for and that individual members Individual senators uh, have asked of uh, ministers and departments uh, and indeed agencies, because that is what we are here to do. It doesn't really matter what side of politics you come from. The job of the Senate is to scrutinise legislation and hold government and government officials to account. That is our job. It isn't a winner-takes-all parliament. And I continually am surprised at the uh, lack of um, acceptance from some within the government that they didn't actually uh, they don't actually have control of this chamber they don't control the senate and they never will the australian people have voted for diversity in this place for a reason because it forces all sides of politics to work together to get better outcomes, to ensure that uh, mistakes are picked up before they're made, to ensure that accountability of individual uh, ministers and departments is uh, had, and that there is basic transparency so that the public, the community uh, and uh, those who um, are actually uh, neck deep in policy development uh, actually have a good idea of what's really going on. And I just look at this list of questions and I think, mm, sometimes it feels like it's just stubbornness, just basic stubbornness, that government ministers, some government, not all, some are quite good, but some have a, uh, a less favourable record than others when it comes to coughing up information. It's as if they've got the messiah uh, complex. I'm in charge, uh, my way or the highway. Oh, it doesn't really matter if the Senate's asking for things. Well, no, it does matter. It does matter. And I know there is a um, long list of um, uh, orders of production of documents. There has been many orders passed through this place. And I know the government is becoming more and more frustrated with that. However, 
unless you start to actually participate in the transparency of government and work with the Senate to get across these issues, then you know what? There's going to be more and more of these questions and requests from the parliament, because otherwise we're being asked to vote on legislation without having all of the information. I've got some uh, questions and uh, orders of production or documents that I've put into the government that are still outstanding. And no excuse, except that they don't want to put the work in. Decisions that were made by the previous government that they won't even reveal. Well, I'm sorry, not my problem. We need the information, we have required the information, the government must cough it up. And I don't. What strikes me is that it's not just a um, an individual minister's problem here. This seems to be a reoccurring uh, attitude and a growing attitude within uh, this government that they don't have to comply uh, with requests of information of this chamber. Um, and I don't think that's a very good way of building collaboration. I don't think it's a very good way of enlisting trust. Uh, and I don't think um, it's acceptable to think that uh, the Senate can be ignored. Now, we're about to have another round of estimates after this budget, and there's going to be a whole lot of new areas to be inquiring into and detail to be getting into because we're going to have the new budget. But there are so many questions that remain outstanding uh, from the previous estimates and the estimates before. I mean, one particular issue that I'm concerned about is that the government has made promises in relation to streaming services. You know, they went to the election saying that they would put quotas on streaming services, which they should something that I've fought very hard for for a long time in this place. Now, through a Senate pro committee process, we've asked for the documents that the government department has issued to stakeholders and industry players, but they're refusing to give that information to the parliament. Now, I'm sorry if the big TV broadcasters and the big tech giants can have access to this information, so should the Australian Parliament. Why is the Minister for Communications refusing to give this information? It's actually out there. Stakeholders have been told, oh, here's a private confidential copy. Please don't tell anybody about it. Yet when the parliament and the Senate ask for this information so that we can understand what the government is planning, we can be prepared, we can participate in the transparency and accountability process of government, we are denied. So Foxtel, Netflix, Amazon, the big streaming giants get access to this information, but the parliament doesn't. Who do you govern for? The big tech giants or the Australian people? And this is just one example. This is just one example of the arrogance that is seeping into this government's attitude to how this chamber should be responded to and dealt with. And I say to government ministers in this place and to uh, those watching that once you start sliding into this type of attitude, it's hard to put the brakes on. And we saw that with the last government, the arrogance that ended up sweeping through the front bench of the previous government, the lack of respect for the chamber, the lack of respect for other voices and the diverse views in this place, the lack of ultimate respect to the taxpayer and the people who vote at election time based on the promises uh, and the um, uh, policies that are put forward. And once you start thinking you're better than 
the entire parliament. It is the road to hell. So don't fall foul of the arrogant attitude that Mr Morrison, the former Prime Minister, fell foul of. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to think that anyone would start appointing themselves to secret ministries. Um, but it all starts somewhere. It all starts somewhere. And it starts with refusing to think that you're accountable to the parliament. And it ends with the prime minister, the former prime minister, who didn't even think he was accountable to his own cabinet. He started secretly appointing himself. So let's, let's actually think about um, how we want government and this parliament to actually deal with and respect the Australian people, the taxpayers and the voters. And it's has to start with the basic commitment to transparency of government. Once that starts to be negotiated away, oh, just a little bit over here, or oh, just cover up over here, or just denial of this over there, it is the road to hell. And the Australian people expect better and deserve better. So when their representatives come into this place asking for information from the government and their agencies, it needs to be coughed up. It's not up to you as individual ministers to think you can just hide behind delay, cabinet incompetence, I mean the, the, the cloak of secrecy that gets dragged over everything. If you want this parliament to work, to deliver the things that you have promised, you must work with it. So this extraordinary amount of outstanding questions and orders for production of documents, um, it should alarm you that less than 12 months on, you are already in breach of the basic courtesy of being transparent and upfront uh, with not just the chamber and the parliament, but the Australian people that you purport to represent. And I would hope that despite the budget being handed down tonight, and this being the government's day, and you know, there's, I'm sure there's lots of, lots of goodies in there that you're um, hoping to spruik and be proud of, and I hope that we are genuinely going to see some relief uh, for people to the enormous pressures of cost of living that everyday people are feeling right now, and particularly the most vulnerable and marginalised in our communities. But you can't just promise headlines and then not deliver the policy grit and grunt that comes with it. And in order to ensure that that is there, you're going to have to be transparent with this chamber. If we spend the next two uh, estimate weeks uh, hearing from government ministers and department secretaries that they can't tell us the details of things, well, I'm sorry. Um, don't expect this place to be rubber stamping your legislation. Why is it that government officers uh, and department officials are so often more interested in not answering, que answering questions at Senate estimates than giving the information? And the whole process of Senate estimates is to enlist confidence that what the government of the day, regardless of the politics, regardless of what side of the chamber you sit on. It's about enlisting confidence that the policies that are being put forward and the programs that are being that money is being spent on and that the decisions that are being made are sound. And yet year after year after year what we are confronted with, particularly from the Senate crossbench uh, perspective, is government officers, department secretaries, 
who spend their entire time trying not to answer questions. Often I find it takes more energy not to answer a question than just to be up front. I, mean, I know in this place we often, you know, the, the politics creeps in and the sport of the of chamber debate creeps in. But when it comes to Senate estimates, it is not up to departmental officials to play the sport of politics. They are public servants and they should be allowed to answer basic questions. They should be directed from their ministers to be as helpful as possible, to be as transparent as possible, to go out of their way to help the Senate understand what they are doing, what they have been directed to do and what they are spending money on. That is their job. Their job is not to be an extension of the political arm of government. They are public servants, not servants of the government. Senator Rice. Thanks, Deputy President. Look, I want to um, thank Senator Rustin for putting this motion about unanswered questions before the Senate today, um, because the number of unanswered questions from estimates and other questions on notice is astounding, and they have critical implications for transparency in government and particularly transparency about programs that are failing, that are having huge impacts on Australians. And today, Budget Day, we're talking about budget being, choice, being about choices, being about deciding who this government's supporting and who it isn't. And it's very clear from the silence on some issues that there are particular groups of people that are not being supported in this budget, not being supported by this government. I also have many unanswered questions in the portfolios that I'm responsible for the Greens, particularly those to the Minister for Social Security, the Department of Social Security, and um, to do with our income support system and to do with the absolutely punitive um, conditions that people living on income support are having to face when it comes to so-called mutual obligations, which are ridiculous hoops that they've got to jump through, ridiculous trials that people are put through just to be able to continue to receive payments that are below the poverty line. I've got one unanswered question, which was about payment suspensions. And these are people who are on income support, who are on job seeker, who are having their payments suspended. So I asked a question at last estimates about the number of payment suspensions by demographic group and program, the number of individuals subject to payment suspensions, the number of payment suspensions broken down by type of participation failure by program from, for each month from December 2020 to the present, the number of payment suspensions leading to a payment delay or cancellation, demerity, demerit and penalty counts by stage of the targeted compliance framework, and the number of payment on hold messages and conversion, to pay and conversion to payment suspensions. This is critical information because we've got people who are trying to survive, as I said, on below poverty line payments, who are absolutely struggling to put food on the table, to pay their medical bills, to pay their rent, to get their kids off to school and actually be able to put shoes on their feet. And there are people in these conditions who are having their payments suspended. Their payments suspended because they are not fulfilling their mutual obligations. These are the people who can least afford to suddenly have no income coming in. They're people that have, haven't got big bank accounts to fall back on. A lot of people that haven't got family support. They haven't got friends that they can suddenly borrow $1,000 from. They are people for whom, if the money's not coming in, they don't eat. It means for the, these people, if their payments are suspended, they go hungry. It means that they can't afford to pay their rent and are at risk of being evicted. It means that they can't go off to the chemist and pay for their medication that might be keeping critical medical conditions under control. It has desperate impacts on their mental health, let alone the impacts on their mental health of knowing that 
there is no money coming in. And I have spoken to many people who tell me when they've been put in this situation, the damage it does to their mental health, the suicide ideation. These payment suspensions, they literally kill people. That is absolutely what happens. And yet the basic data of how many payment suspensions, to whom, why, that information is not forthcoming. I mean, I asked these questions on the 20th of March, seven weeks ago, and silence since then. I mean, what does this say about this government's regard for the people surviving on income support payments who are at the mercy of this punitive mutual obligation system? I mean, income support payments are meant to provide a much needed support, and payment suspensions have devastating impact on the people who rely on them. So, and in addition, payment suspensions can create a cycle of debt and poverty. If a recipient falls behind, they can't pay their bills, they can't pay their rent. They can then be forced to turn to credit cards or payday loans to make ends meet, which can lead to a cycle of debt that is incredibly hard to escape. Certainly does not put people in a good spot to be able to take on um, finding work. It makes it incredibly hard for people to retain financial stability. We've had considerable evidence pointed out, um, brought to us in the committee that I've been chairing, the Senate Community Affairs References Committee inquiry into the extent and nature of poverty in Australia. And I'd like to read some of the evidence which um, we featured in the interim report, which I am going to be tabling this afternoon. Um, where Dr Elise Klein, um, in her evidence that she gave to the committee, um, which of course is already published, she drew attention to the impact of two features that impacted on people, people's inability to live in, in poverty, and the, the impact of poverty. One was the base rates of payments, and the other was these mutual obligations. And she noted that two particular features are important to note. The low base rate of payment, which contributes to material deprivation, and the use of mutual obligations and conditionalities that stigmatise and disempower and can lead to the withholding of income. Together, they produce hostile conditions that are said to propel people into employment. However, this logic of deterrence completely overlooks that people cannot work in that they have a disability or illness, that there are not enough jobs, particularly in remote regions of the country, or that people receiving payments are already working, undertaking the critical work of unpaid care, which is essential for the economy of society. And Dr Klein noted that according to ACOS, of the people receiving unemployment payments, 40% have a disability, 47% are 45 years or older, 20% are from culturally, linguistically and diverse backgrounds, 10% are First Nations peoples, and 13% are raising a child alone. We see from these numbers the very real ableist, racist and gendered impacts of the government's policy approach to those its subjects to policy. And critically, instead of understanding the important care obligations people have or the very re real situations that stop people from working, people are subjected to payments well below the poverty line. What's also deplorable is that children are punished through these policies. It is hard to think that this policy-induced poverty could be anything but state violence against our nation's children. And so then when we ask questions about mutual obligations, about these payment suspensions, we don't receive any answers. I also want to read from a document prepared by the Anti-Poverty Centre titled Compulsory Activities Do Not Address Employment Barriers. The Anti-Poverty Centre has collected the below stories from people in the welfare system in the days preceding our appearance at the Workforce Australia Select Committee briefing. They've been collected from a group of people who are traumatised by unemployment and the welfare system, who generously volunteered to participate in the protest to be held on the International Day for the Eradication of Poverty by sharing their stories as an act of resistance to the government-manufactured poverty machine that traps so many of us. This is not a cherry-picked sample of the stories we receive designed to skew the perception of what is happening. Every person to, who submitted to us is included below. Employment services purport to address unemployment and constantly fail to do so. 
You cannot separate unemployment from the person who is unemployed and their whole circumstances. The first story, which I want to share from this document, highlights the dire impacts of the threats of payment suspensions, this information that we were seeking from the government that we have got no information about. It's about Jared. Jared's on Job Seeker and currently has mutual obligations requirements. And he says, I've been a hard worker my entire adult life. I'm now 38. And a few years ago, I had an extremely bad series of incidents at my work, which ruined my physical and mental health and drove me to attempt suicide, and since then I've been in decline. I've had to struggle with rising costs in living, rent, bills, medications and specialists, all on the insufficient funds provided by the government. Due to the renting crisis, all I have left after my payment is less than $60 for a fortnight, and I'm somehow expected to live on this. Without any additional help from friends and family, I would have long since been homeless or dead. I have fought against daily thoughts of suicide, and my depression and anxiety has become dangerous because of this constant struggle and stress. I am living day to day, and I often don't know how I am going to get through the next week and pay for what I need to pay. I am now disabled, but not disabled enough to get on the disability support pension, and the entire process is a mammoth task with impossible hurdles. I'm constantly fighting against your system and getting medical exemptions where I can because I cannot work, but all of the systems in place tell me I can, that I have to, or I'll lose my payment, yet I can barely get out of bed each day. I have to get family and friends to help me do even the most basic of tasks. But sure, according to my provider, I can do many hours a week of work. Please, please, for everyone that is struggling, please raise the rate, end mutual obligations, end the privatisation of these systems. Make the disability support pension more accessible. I don't want to die. This is the impact that these punitive, our punitive income support system is having on people. With these sorts of impacts, you would think that the least the government could do would be to be transparent about the data, to be transparent about the number of people that are being impacted by this punitive system. But we know why they don't want to be, because it would be overwhelming evidence that the system is not working, that mutual obligations are not working, that mutual obligations need to be abolished, that they are keeping people out of employment, that they are keeping people in poverty, that they are keeping people totally oppressed and totally feeling that they are just a tiny cog in an enormous machine. That's why this information, answering these questions, is critical. That's why it is critical that this government is transparent, because then it would be obvious that we need a different way. I want to share another story. This one was shared anonymously, and it highlights the challenges of meeting, meeting your so-called mutual obligations if you can't afford a phone or have limited technical abilities. I've been living in poverty on Centrelink payments. I'll study the New Start job seeker since leaving high school almost nine years back. I've never been able to afford housing that meets my needs as a disabled person with trauma from multiple domestic violence situations from various cohabitors. I can barely afford anywhere to live at all, actually, and the fact that I'm once again likely having to find a place to live with current prices within my greater area starting at 70 per cent of full job seeker payment is soul-crushing. I spend hundreds of dollars a month on medication and medical equipment I need to live on a day-to-day -day basis. I can't afford to see specialists for things like my ADHD or autism. I can barely afford basic foods. Almost any meat I buy is nearly off, any veg frozen, any snack half price or made from scratch. Almost all of my money goes directly to rent, bills, food, medical costs. The poultry leftovers aren't enough to cover keeping my car on the road. I have to ask for help pretty much every year. Almost every job I've ever applied for has specifically stated that applicants need a car, so people on JobSeeker are literally priced out of being able to work. New clothes are cast off from friends or from the clearance section at an already cheap store. 
I've never been able to buy my own phone, which, by the way, is needed just to access Centrelink payments. And an up-to-date phone with reasonable technical specs is a necessity for the vast majority of jobs I've worked or applied for. The current system of mutual obligations is unfair and punitive, and it often leads to people's payments being suspended through no fault of their own. And that's the critical information. That's why we were asking questions about the numbers of people, the suspensions by demographic group and program, the numbers of individuals subject to payment suspensions, the numbers broken down by type of participation, the numbers that lead to a payment delay or cancellation. This is important information to be in the public eye. This is important information so it is very clear that our system is broken, that we need to be doing more, that we need to be supporting people who are currently trapped in poverty. And by not providing this information, by not acting to abolish these punitive mutual obligations, the government is choosing to leave people in these circumstances. It is a political choice that's being made to be leaving people in abject poverty and feeling crushed under the punitive mutual obligations. We can do more. This government clearly in the budget tonight is not going to be taking action to be supporting people, but we as Greens are going to continue to fight for people until they have justice. Does any other senator wish to make a contribution on the motion moved by Senator Rustin? I intend to put the question. I put the question that the motion moved by Senator Rustin be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. We now come to item eight. Take note of... Oh, sorry, Senator Rustin. Yes. Um, I also had a question pursuant to Standing Order 45, um, asking the minister representing the Minister of Housing and Homelessness for an explanation as to why an answer has not been provided to questions on notice number 1520 and 1521, which I asked on the 20th of March. Um, relating to the impact of rental increases on rates of homelessness and extending funding for homelessness services. Minister. Uh, thanks, uh, Deputy Chair. Um, I'm not certain that uh, advice, uh, the Minister's office were forewarned. Um, what I was hoping is if you could uh, enunciate which questions they were and we'll try and come back to you um, as soon as possible. Senator Rice. Mm, they were questions 1520 and 1521 and the Minister's office was forewarned Yep, a good couple of hours ago. So, look, I move that the Senate take note of the, of the government's failure, the minister's failure, to provide an answer or an explanation to these questions. Yeah, the call. Um, I mean, I've asked for a question with these two questions in particular because they're very pertinent to the discussion that you know, the government put on the notice paper of discussing the housing, their housing affordability <laughs> future fund, their completely inadequate response to the housing crisis. Again. Actually, having information, having data relating to housing, relating to homelessness is critical. And it would be showing, and it does show, how inadequate the government's response to the housing crisis is. The questions that I asked were, what modelling has the, gov has the department undertaken of the impact of rental increases on the rates of homelessness? And has the government taken a decision in relation to extending funding for homelessness services in relation to the social and community services equal numeration order? Even though I asked this, that second one, I'll start with the second one, because that question was asked on the 20th of March. Um, and I understand from media reports that, in fact, the government did make a decision, but they haven't bothered to answer my question on notice. It would have been very simple to answer my question on notice after media reports on the 23rd of March that they decided the government had decided to extend some more funding just for the next year in response to the fact that homelessness services are absolutely smashed with a huge increase of the number of people being homeless. The figures on census night that showed that we had 120,000 homeless Australians. 
So the government has taken a stopgap effort of providing some extra funding. Would have been nice to just have had my question on notice responded to, but no. It really shows just how little consideration this government has to the very legitimate questions of the senators in this place. It seems that they, just, they think that they're above having to answer basic questions. But these questions are critical. But the first question is, you know, what modelling has the government has the department undertaken of the impact of rental increases on rates of homelessness? It's pretty critical to understand what the intersection between homelessness and rent increases. The housing crisis is affecting millions of people across the country, and this government is not taking the steps to fix it. Yet it claims to be taking issues of housing and homeless, homelessness serious. I mean, this question goes to the issue of rental affordability, something that you think that a government that was concerned about should be on top of. They should have good data in their fingertips. In fact, they should have done some modelling on it. You would think if this government was serious about tackling the housing crisis, that that question should have been very quick, very easy to answer, to have come back to me and said, yep, here's the modelling we've done. We understand what impact the skyrocketing rents are having on homelessness and this is what we're doing about it. But no. And the fact that they haven't answered my question seven weeks on, it leads one to presume that you know, maybe they haven't actually done any modelling. Despite having a crisis in rents, skyrocketing rents, perhaps they actually haven't done any modelling. Perhaps they're not even really looking at this issue. They, this issue. They're happy to see rents skyrocket on one side, housing homelessness skyrocket on the other, but are not willing to put two and two together and to show that we need to be doing something about the skyrocketing rents to be tackling homelessness. I mean, they could model, for example, what having a rent freeze might do to rates of homelessness. The Greens have been, you know, we know that we are not going to be able to tackle the housing crisis and tackle skyrocketing rents unless we actually do something about those skyrocketing rents. A rent freeze. You know, our request has been for the government to put that on the, on the national cabinet agenda, which, yes, we'll give them credit for, after pressure from the Greens as part of our negotiations over their housing bill, it was on the national cabinet agenda. Now we want to actually see some action. We want to see some action from the state and territory governments led by the federal government to say we need a rent freeze. You'd think that they might have done some modelling on that. I want to just go to how significant this is and the impact of rents on homelessness. Anglicare Australia, they do an annual rental affordability snapshot. They've just recently released their 2023 report and they describe the results as alarming. This is despite in previous years, things were looking pretty bleak. But in 2023, things are alarming. I want to quote from this report pretty extensively because it's critical to the debate that we're having about housing and why the government needs to get serious about it rather than pretending to do about something about it, rather than pretending that by investing, by gambling $10 billion on the stock market and only committing to 240 houses a year, each year, per state, pretending that that's going to do something about it. So the Anglicare 2023 rental affordability snapshot noted this year there were only 45,895 listings across the country, the lowest number in the history of the snapshot. Australia's vacancy rate remains at its lowest rate on record, at 0.8 of a percent. The market for affordable properties is fiercely competitive, with many households on low incomes unable to get a look into a rental. We heard reports about people queuing down the street for inspections, competing with dozens or even hundreds of other potential renters. Rents have never been less affordable. Average rents have risen by 11 per cent in the last year. And they continue saying, our analysis shows that a mere four rentals, four, were affordable for a single person receiving job seeker across Australia. None were affordable for someone on youth allowance, couples out of work, single parents relying on Centrelink, 
and Australians receiving the disability support pension must all contend with a rental market where 0.2 per cent of rentals were affordable. A person on the age pension can only afford to rent 0.4 per cent of properties, and the percentage of affordable rentals for a person on the minimum wage has dropped to below 1 per cent for the first time. Such dire results have a real impact on people's lives. They show that large numbers of Australians will not be able to land a lease without getting into severe rental stress. This means that people can be forced into unfair choices like skipping meals, foregoing essentials or turning to payday loans to get by. As our rental crisis becomes a permanent reality, many people can expect to live in these conditions for, the, for most of their lives. Our results show that we're in the middle, midst of a crisis that can no longer be ignored by governments. There has never been a more critical time for governments across the country to step up and ensure that every Australian has a place to call home. And you'd think that a basic part of that stepping up would be to actually do the analysis so that you could then take action to do something about it. Actually do some modelling and actually let the Senate know what the results of that modelling are. But no. All we have is the government's current housing bill, that there's not a guaranteed dollar that's going to be spent on housing. And if the fund loses money like it did last year, there's no money that would be spent on that public housing. All they've done is had to commit to a minimum of 1,200 properties over the forward estimates per state. That's 240 a year. 240 houses in my home state of Victoria. When you've got a public housing waiting list that is decades long. And even if the fund comes into effect, you won't see a single house built before the next election. And at the end of the fund, the waiting list is going to be longer than it is now. I mean, we need a rent freeze now. We're seeing the biggest rent increases in 14 years, putting millions of Australians into severe rental stress, families sleeping in their cars, workers unable to afford a home near where they work, people being effect evicted from their homes because they can't afford 20 per cent rent increases, and the government's just sitting on their hands when they've got the capacity to intervene and stop the worst of this crisis. And yet you ask them the question about what they're doing it and silence. In the past 12 months, rents in capital cities have grown seven times faster than wages. Just as the government coordinated a national response to the COVID-19 health crisis, the federal government should intervene to coordinate an emergency nationwide response to the housing crisis, and that includes a rent freeze. And at the very, very beginning of that process, actually do the work to see what impact that the skyrocketing rent increases are having on, on homelessness. I mean, under the Greens plan, National Cabinet would agree on national tenancy standards that would include a two-year emergency rent freeze. And this would be followed by ongoing rent caps and an end to no grounds evictions, minimum standards for rental properties and giving tenants the right to make minor improvements to their homes. And with more and more people renting long term, we desperately need legislative protections against unfair arbitrary evictions and skyrocketing rents. I mean, the other element of this is that Rising house prices and rents means that people can't afford, they're paying so much of their income on rents that they can't afford the other basic necessities of life, such as food, healthcare and education. And especially true for, people, for low income earners and people on income support who are being forced to spend an absolutely huge proportion of their income on housing, which of course is then exacerbating homelessness. More and more people being forced into homelessness, a devastating impact on the people affected and a significant burden on the healthcare system and other support services. And the evidence we have heard through the Senate inquiry into poverty was heartbreaking of in regional towns where every car park along the highway has got every night at least half a dozen cars with people living in their cars, of people bringing their kids up living in cars. That's what the reality of the housing crisis means. And yet this government can't even see its way clear to provide basic information to the Senate about what impact 
the rental uh, rents are having on 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 homelessness. Um, I, I want to share some more stories here from people who have given evidence at the poverty inquiry about people living at the intersection of the housing and the cost of living crisis. There was a man, Brian, who said, my flatmate Morris and I have been living in public housing since 1997 and 2008. We've had two years of flooding from a neighbour above us, with 10 floodings in two years, with human faeces in what was coming down. Len said, the reason I've come here today is to say part of the reason I went on the streets was that I couldn't cope on the money. I couldn't cope on the money paving pri paying private rental, going through what I was going through, the depression and whatever. But what brought me off the streets was permanent affordable housing. And that extra couple of hundred dollars that I was getting on the disability pension gave me a chance. And people who are living in poverty they also face the issue of discrimination and stigmatisation when it comes to housing. They experience marginalisation and social exclusion, which makes it really difficult, even if there are more affordable houses, makes it really difficult for them secure, to secure adequate housing. For example, landlords can refuse to rent to them or may charge them high rents due to their income level, background or other factors. I mean, the difficulties faced in by people living in, in poverty in finding adequate housing in Australia are really significant and really complex. And it's crucial that the government do the work that realises that we're in a housing crisis, commit to doing the work that's necessary. I mean, we, need, it's, we have to have enough sufficient, affordable and secure housing options. We need to ensure access to essential services and facilities and combating discrimination and stigma. And only then will we be able to ensure that everyone has an access to a safe, secure and a dignified place to call home. And the Greens believe that everyone should be able to afford a home that meets their needs, whether they are renting or buying. I mean, we need to, do, to tackle these issues head on. I mean, homelessness is a complex issue and there's no one size f solution. But we know that there are a range of things that we can do, that governments can do, that there are choices being made now to not do these things, to invest in, we need to have much greater investment in affordable housing, much greater funding for emergency accommodation support services, providing access to legal advice and representation for renters facing eviction, and establishing a national strategy to prevent and to end homelessness. I mean, we need to make sure that everyone has got access to safe and healthy homes. Everyone's got the right to live in a home that's free from harmful toxins, moulds and other environmental hazards. And we need to build a fairer, more sustainable and more inclusive society for all. These are the choices that could be being made by this government, that aren't being made by this government, that the Australian Greens will continue to campaign for. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Chisholm. Uh, thanks, Acting Deputy Chair. And I just wanted to provide some clarity to the Chamber and to Senator Rice, uh, re questions on Notice 1520 and 1521. Uh, my understanding is they were transferred from social services to housing and homelessness, um, which is a standard administrative procedure. Uh, Minister Collins' office uh, has no knowledge of being notified but we'll table answers tomorrow. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to have a private conversation to see if we've missed something there, Senator Rice. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. There being no other senators to contribute on that motion, I'll put the motion um, that the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. We now move to take note. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Acting Deputy. President, uh, and I move to take note of the answer given by Senator Wong, representing the Treasurer, to the question from Senator Smith relating to immigration and rental costs. <coughs> Acting Deputy President, this question goes specifically to the issues that the government has been saying that it intends to focus on in relation to the budget, which is ensuring it drives down inflation. But it then also goes to what the government has continuously been doing, is saying one thing and doing another. And it's a 
very common theme in um, pre my presentations and taking note in the chamber, I have, I'm sad to say. Uh, and we've just spent the last hour and ten minutes debating about the fact that they talked about being an open and transparent government, uh, and they're more, more, more opaque than a brick. You, uh, it, the contradictions, the speaking out of both sides of their, their mouths, uh, is really quite outrageous. They come into the chamber and they make all the excuses under the sun. They deflect the problem to here. They blame the previous government. Uh, but in this context, on this particular issue, the government is actually in full control because they control the immigration rates. Now, Senator Wong, in her answer, quite reasonably mentioned the fact that the economy and the immigration system is recovering from COVID. Quite a reasonable point for Senator Wong to make. Quite a reasonable point for Senator Wong to make. But it's this government that is controlling the immigration rate. She can't blame the previous government. She can't blame anyone else. Has COVID made a contribution to the issues around immigration? Absolutely it did. Is there a process for recovery off the back of that? Of course there is. But there is also another part to what's occurring in the economy, and that's the shortage of housing that exists. Now, clearly, COVID's contributed to the way that people live, to the way that they um, share accommodation or not share accommodation, a whole range of those things. But the government is the, th is, is the entity. The government is the entity that's controlling immigration in this country. And we'll do so over the next couple of years. So for a record number of people to be coming into this country, 400 immigrants this year, 315,000 next year, a record 715,000 people over the next two years, a number and a figure they control. It's got nothing to do with anybody else. It's got nothing to do with anybody else. It's something that the government controls. And are there tensions in the economy around labour and things of that nature? Of course there are. But one of the themes of the previous taking note was about housing, housing affordability and the capacity for people to get a home. And it is a big deal. It is a big deal. But the government controls the immigration rate. And that was the point of Senator Smith's question in relation to where we are right now. Now, the government will want to deflect and talk about the housing bill. Hasn't built a house yet. Mr Albanese said in 2001 that it would build, um, what was it? Houses would start to come online in the first five years. You gave, gave a guarantee of the number of houses that will come online in the first five years. Well, we are almost a year into government. They haven't built a house yet. Not one single foundation laid at this point in time. So not a good start in that sense. And if it was so, so urgent, why have we waited a year for the legislation? But the thing then comes back to the, the point of the budget and what the budget's supposed to be saying for the future and the issues facing Australians, which is inflation. And the Reserve Bank this month said Rent inflation is expected to continue to pick up over the next year or so and to add materially to inflation over the forecast period. Now, what's the Reserve Bank going to do if inflation keeps on going up? We just had a surprise 0.25 per cent, perhaps a shot across the government's bows. Perhaps a shot across the government's bows. Now the government is going to contribute, continue to contribute to rising inflation through immigration levels that are going to cause housing inflation, which would feed directly into the numbers. So why, was the why is the Reserve Bank saying that? That's the point of Senator Smith's question. And the government controls the answers. They can't try to blame other people in relation to this, because they are the government and they are in charge. Order. Senator Colbert, your time has expired. Senator Stewart. Thank you, Acting Deputy Chair. It's quite shameful, really, to pretty old playbook to be blaming immigrants and migrants for our housing crisis when you were in government for almost a decade. It's almost like you're reading One Nation's notes. 
almost like you're reading One Nation Order. notes. But sure, let's Order. talk about— Order. Senator Stewart. Senator Colbeck is on his feet. Uh, uh, Acting Deputy President, that is a reflection on me and what I've said. It is a reflection on me and what I've said, um, and, and it is against standing orders yes. to suggest yes. that what I've just said is racist, is a reflection Order. on Order me, Senator Colbeck. and should Order. be withdrawn. Thank Order, Senator Colbeck. I, I don't think that was a reflection on you, but and I do recognise that we have quite a wide-ranging debate during take note. Um, but I will suggest to Senator Stewart that she be cognisant of the question and the response that we are taking note of, and ensure that her comments are relevant to that. The impact of immigration on housing. I feel like I've been directly relevant. So we have inherited an absolute mess of a situation in our nation. Those opposite had almost a decade to do something about it, and all of a sudden they care about putting roofs over people's heads. Shameful and embarrassing to be over there asking these questions of us. Be asking these questions of us. So not only are we doing things to respond to the housing crisis and the rental crisis that we've got in this country, we're doing things and getting things done. We're making childcare cheaper. We're making medicines cheaper. We're delivering 180,000 fee-free TAFE places. We're funding a pay rise for aged care workers. We're delivering 20,000 new university places. We're providing up to $10,000 for each person who takes up a new energy apprenticeship. We've passed legislation for paid parental leave. We've established 10 days paid family and domestic violence leave, specifically small business workers can access from the 1st of August this year. We're advancing a voice to parliament. We've got to work to repair our international relations. Foreign Minister Penny Wong has visited 32 countries since her appointment, five of them more than once. We are getting on with the job of governing this country, as well as making a real and practical difference to the lives of every Australian. Almost every one of these measures that we've brought to this place has been voted against by those opposite. It's almost like they actually don't want a better future for all Australians. They want to take us back to the time when they were in power and did nothing. Right now, we have a bill before this chamber, the Housing Australia Future Fund bill, which will see a $10 billion investment. The fund will see, will support the government's commitment to deliver 30,000 new social and affordable homes in the next five years. Going directly to the supply issue in response to the demand. That's what we're doing. You did nothing. You did nothing. Not only shamefully are they going to vote against it, the Greens who cry about rental affordability and the housing crisis that we've got in this country, they're going to team up with the Libs and vote this down. Because the Greens and the opposition think that they know better than housing experts from across academia, industry and community, because they've given their views on this housing package. They've described it as transformative reform that will enable housing that will enable the housing needs of more Australians to be met. When asked if the Senate should move more quickly to support the package, the Community Housing Industry Association declared it was absolutely urgent. They also said, we have to put something in place right now. The Urban Development Institute said, every day that passes is costing them more and more. The Property Council said, the quicker all of these mechanisms are up and running, the better. The National Shelter described it as the most critical housing legislation to be brought forward for the past 10 years. But they're all teaming up to vote it down because they don't think that this is a better future for Australians. An absolute shame and indictment on these. So when, at the end of today or tomorrow, whenever we go to a, a, a vote on this bill, I hope those opposite and the Greens can front up to the Australian people and tell them why they don't care about easing the cost of living pressures that are on the Australian people, why they don't care about 
helping ease the housing and rental crisis that we've got, and why they don't care about the $200 million that is going to go into the repair, maintenance of remote housing for Indigenous Australians. I hope that you front up to the Australian people when you both team up, the Greens and the opposition, to vote this down. Shame on you. Thank you, Senator Stewart. Uh, Senator Antic. Um, thank you. And I also take note of the uh, uh, questions from Senator Smith regarding immigration and the rental crisis. And uh, despite what we've heard this afternoon, um, Australians are, are welcoming people, and they're people who, uh, despite what we hear from Labor and the Greens and their mates in the socialist media industrial complex, uh, are, are, uh, are nothing of the sort. They're, we're not racist people. We're welcoming people. And uh, immigration served this country well. Uh, I'm proof of that, of course. Uh, having been here as the son of uh, an immigrant family, we all we all know that. But let's be clear: uh, Australians are not stupid. They're not going to be sold a pup on this one. They understand that there's a time and a place for policy levers, uh, including increases, modest. We love the word modest in this place. Modest increases uh, in in immigration. Uh, but uh, th at this stage, for the Labor government to even be suggesting that something in the order of 715,000 uh, new immigrants over the next two years is even remotely reasonable uh, is, is, is a nonsense. And there are a myriad of reasons why that is, uh, and they include, uh, but they're not limited to, the extraordinary pressure that that's going to place on our infrastructure and uh, on our housing system. Um, it just can't sustain this sort of target, and we really have. We heard that there are going to be, uh, you know, I think the number was 30,000 new homes built. Well, my maths is pretty poor, but 30,000 into 715,000 doesn't seem to add up. Now, where are these people going to go? We're just going to build tents uh, and have those uh, in the middle of cities. I mean, this is just doesn't, does not, does not stack up. And I know that the government likes to sell these decisions in a very simplistic sort of way. Don't worry about it. We've got it all under control. It's modest. Don't ask questions. We've got this under control. But the truth is here that this migration pitch is going to cause problems which I don't think this government are even uh, aware of and I think are ignoring uh, at their own peril. Because the Australian people, as I said, are not, are not silly. And they don't want this. They don't want it, particularly in places like Sydney and Melbourne where the infrastructure is already heaving under the, under the weight of large population uh, numbers. Um, they don't want this intake, and they don't want it at least until there are improvements in investment made in infrastructure, uh, improvements to schooling, improvements to the road system, uh, as I said, to education, to hospitals and to houses. Uh, what Australians actually want are cutting of red tape, lowering of taxes, bringing business back, uh, cutting power prices. Now, that's one we've heard uh, all the way through the last election. 275, was it? 275 dollars in power bills that were going to drop. And what have we seen since then? Straight upwards, straight upwards, straight up. And we'd be looking, I guess, uh, at a different, you know, at a different proposition if we were looking at the old, the old Labor Party. Remember the old Labor Party that used to stand for the, for the battlers? Used to stand for. Uh, you know, working people we used to take those sorts of things into account, uh, and now we've got a Labor Party that's not only uh, bursting energy prices all over the country, sh shattering that myth of a $275 promise. 90, how many? 98 times? 97? 96? My mistake. 96 times we were told that bursting those energy prices. Um, we're seeing a government that's giving us huge higher inflationary pressures, which this is only going to contribute to, by the way, higher rents, uh, and all at the same time as now we're seeing an enormous increase in migration. What this shows is that this party, the government, the Australian Labor Party, is no longer the party of the battlers and the workers. It's the party of the inner city elites. Uh, and we can see that every single day, every time we, we look at these pictures, it's, and it's all getting very comfortable. Um, they uh, here are 
now turbocharging those cost of living pressures that we just talked about. That's what this will do. Make no mistake, this isn't going to, this isn't going to be some magic wand they can, they can wave. And if you look at uh, South Australia, if you look at the, um, the SQM research, which uh, details the changes in rental costs, now the South Australian housing market is relatively stable. Um, we've seen some, some increases recently, but uh, as at 4 May, uh, the, the increase in house rental prices is 11.4 per cent alone. Uh, the increase in units is 11.4 per cent, and that's, that's almost the good news. Because let's turn to New South Wales and Victoria, where we can see uh, order, something in the Senator order of a 20 per cent. Your time has expired. Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Um, you know, coming in today, uh, we've heard some really interesting contributions by Senators um, and particularly some interesting interjections on, on the topic of, uh, of housing and rental affordability. Uh, and you sort of think that um, somehow this government's been in power for the last decade, but yet those opposite who have been here on the Treasury benches for uh, a full decade wasted an opportunity to really address not just the rental crisis that we're currently facing, but also the housing market. Uh, and now trying to blame Labor for somehow their failures uh, over the last uh, over the last uh, nine years, uh, and really uh, last month the National um, Housing Finance and Investment Corporation State of the Nation's Housing Report uh, that was released showed and confirmed the need for all governments, all governments, industry and the housing stakeholders to work together in order to improve the housing outcomes for Australians, particularly those uh, most vulnerable Australians. And it confirms that the proposed housing uh, future fund that the Labor government uh, is putting here in, in the parliament will in actual fact double the number of new social housing dwellings, adding to the stock each year for at least the five years from the year 2024 compared to the period between 2006 and 2021. And the minister has confirmed that the fund is an absolutely important policy that this government is determined to ensure pass this parliament, to work with those in this parliament to address the housing challenges that we are currently facing. Uh, the report is another reminder that too many Australians, too many Australians, particularly those who are vulnerable, are struggling to secure safe and affordable housing. No matter which part of the country, it is a crisis that we're all trying to address. The findings highlight the need to pass legislation that is currently uh, before this parliament and you know, before this Senate to establish the $10 billion fund that we have discussed time and time and time again. And just to remind senators, this fund will deliver 30,000 new social and affordable housing in the first five years. 30,000. That's something to sneeze at. It will create a secure and ongoing pipeline of funding for social and affordable housing over the long term. And the last time we saw a significant investment was the previous Labor government, the Rudd government, that did see a massive investment in housing. And again, it has taken a Labor government to put real money, real dollars on the table to address the housing crisis, particularly those in social housing. Not those opposite who claim to pretend to look after those who are most vulnerable in our society, as we've heard from some of the contributions today, but it's taken a Labor government, Albanese Labor government, to finally say we, enough is enough. We need to address the housing crisis. And we are trying to unlock that $575 million through the National Housing Infrastructure Facility to invest in social and affordable housing. So far, we've brought together state and territory governments and the Australian Local Government Association, investors and the construction sector together through the National Housing Accord. That sets a shared and, ambitious, and ambition to build one million new homes over five years from 2024 to help increase supply. And we recently committed $67 million to boost funding to states and territories over the next year to also help tackle homelessness and $91 million over the next three years to combat youth homeless through the ReConnect program. And in addition, we are, re we are developing a 10-year national housing and homelessness plan. So it's important to put some of these facts on the table in terms of what this government is trying to do you know, in the first 12 months of being elected 
to government. Uh, but it was really heartening to see reports that the government has welcomed support of the Jackie Lambie uh, network. Um, and I do want to congratulate uh, Senators Lambie and Tyrrell for their support for this very important policy that the government uh, is trying to navigate through the Senate. Uh, the changes that were announced will obviously see many people benefit uh, from the fund. Uh, and it's important steps to make available a minimum of 1,200 dwellings uh, in each state or territory over the first five years from the establishment of this fund. It will also ensure that no state or territory uh, misses out on dwellings under the Albanese government. And that is something that should be repeated again. 1,200 dwellings. Order, Senator Shikoni, your time has expired. Senator Cadell. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. <coughs> again, we rise and we talk about this question about housing, rents, inflation and how it affects people and the effects of immigration on that and cost of living. And I note quite worried in one of these responses from uh, the government side that it is shameful for us to ask these questions. That's a quote from today. It is shameful for the opposition to ask questions about housing supply and immigration. That is the contempt which they deal the Australian people and the opposition. That it is shameful to ask these questions. But here we are. We are hearing that this housing fund, this fabulous $10 billion future fund, will present 30,000 homes over five years. My maths, not real great at maths, think I've got to be. That's about 6,000 a year. That's where I'm going. If we look at the, the maths of that, is they lost, they would have lost last year $365 million on investing housing, and it's only the investment that would build the housing. So how you build 6,000 homes for minus $365 million is a miracle to me. This all answer, this all wonderful fund, doesn't do that. But with this government, best in show is not a policy maker. Best in show is not a minister. Best in show is a spin doctor. Because when we get here and we're talking about the growth of all these policies, what do you get when you have housing going through the roof, the cost of rental going through the roof, the cost of living going through the roof? The answer under this government it's just add 715,000 more people. Now, I, I don't know where we come from, where we're going to build these 30,000 homes. Are they made out of Lego? Probably couldn't even afford that. But this policy comes from cloud cuckoo land. We have housing and rents going through the roof, so we'll just add 715,000 more people to the rental and, and housing accommodation. It doesn't make sense, but we're told this is what happens, and this is what we get time and time again with this government, is the absolute truth of what they're doing will fix everything. But will it? So many times we sit in here and we say, oh, this side voted against their energy relief package. But it got through. If energy prices aren't going down, it's not because of how we voted or they voted or whoever voted. It's because you haven't put the policies in to bring them down. You got your package through. It hasn't worked. Prices are still going up. And we're looking out there in the world. That's what people of Australia want to hear. We're here to make Australia better, not to fight with each other constantly. And so when I'm talking to Stephen at Newcastle Go-Kart Club on the weekend, running up there in a run, and poor Stephen and his son, Logan, great driver, real good talent. He's got a hell of an engine, does 107 in the straight. But when Stephen has to say that his son's racing career might have to go on hold because of housing costs going up, that's the guy's entire potential future of life going away because housing's going up. Adding 715,000 people to the housing market does not bring that down. Building the infrastructure to service more housing at that number, when we're putting a freeze, we're going and reviewing all of the infrastructure pipeline, doesn't help that matter. And that's where the rubber's not meeting the road. There are some very, very good things being said by this government about what they want to do. The legislation does not meet the aspiration. When we're talking about cost of living, the cost of living pressures aren't being put on by the Kremlin. They're coming from the Kirribilli. They're not coming from Luhansk. They're coming from the Lodge. And to blame others is wrong. If there's only some night, some mechanism government could have to work out where they're going to spend money for the next 12 months and four years and get together with some policies and come together one night, maybe a Tuesday in May, 
and say this is what we'll do to make things better. Maybe call it a budget night. If that was sometime soon, they could have answers. But they don't. They have spin. Even this week, of all institutions, the ABC said numbers about debt and inflation is spin. The people of Australia don't want to know what happened five years ago. They want to know this week, this month, this year, can they pay their rents? Can they pay their electricity bills? Can they pay their grocery bills? And there might be cost of living benefits in this budget, but we're putting up their taxes as well. It is tax and spend, tax and spend, all putting inflationary pressures on this. There are no answers. There is just spin, and people deserve better. Uh, so the question is that the motion uh, moved by Senator Colbeck be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Senator Wish Wilson. Yeah, acting Deputy, Pre Deputy President, I rise to take note of uh, responses to Senator Shoebridge's questions to Senator Wong. Five years ago, or nearly five years ago, the only two members of parliament who would meet with Julian Assange's father, John Shipton, were myself and the member for Clark, Andrew Wilkie, in the other place. And John came to see us to see what we could do in here to help his son, Julian Assange, who was at that time in the Ecuadorian embassy and desperately seeking uh, to get out and his freedom. Not long after that, he was incarcerated in a maximum security prison, Belmarsh Prison. And it's been a very long road to try and get any senior politician in this parliament to make any statement in support of Julian Assange. So I welcome Senator Wong again today, uh, reiterating what the Prime Minister said just last week, that they see the ongoing incarceration of Julian Assange as serving no purpose, and that enough is enough. Diplomatically saying, Julian Assange should be freed. It's taken a long road to get to this point. And I welcome the fact that whether it's uh, Stephen Smith, our Consul General in the UK, visiting Mr Assange, or Mr Rudd in the US raising this with his counterpart, uh, the Senator Wong telling us today that they're raising the freeing of Julian Assange at every level of government with the US administration. I welcome that too, and I know uh, millions of Australians will as well. But the next question, Acting Deputy President, that we want answered is what more can you do? What more can this government do? And at what point will the gross abuse of power, the injustice, the political persecution of Julian Assange, a Walkley Award winning journalist, an Australian citizen. At what point will this affect our relationship with our close friends and allies, the United States? That's what we would like an answer to. And perhaps a, an easy place for Senator Wong to start, to show us that she has her heart in this and that uh, she believes in what she's saying, is perhaps put out a simple tweet saying what she said in the Senate today. Because I note she has rightly, and I say rightly, pointed out on Twitter in recent months the political persecution of two other journalists, Wall Street journalist, American, Evan Gershkovich, being held by the Russians on espionage charges, the same charges that Julian Assange is being persecuted on by the US administration. She's also raised the plight of political prisoner Cheng Li, the Australian news anchor for China Global Television, who's also been incarcerated in China. And I thank the Foreign Minister for doing that. But could we have a tweet, at least just one tweet, for the freeing of Julian Assange? A small step to show that this government is serious. She is the foreign minister. She's happy to tweet about other political prisoners, but not about Julian Assange. And the reason I raise the timing of this is because the US president will be here in just a few weeks' time, on the 24th 
of October for the Quad meetings, which Australia is sponsoring in the Sydney Opera House. And I urge the US administration, and I know a lot of Australians, in fact people all around the world agree with me, I urge them to bring this political persecution to a resolution by the time that President Biden comes to Australia. And if we don't get that good news from the Prime Minister when he's standing next to President Biden or delivered in some other way, I call on Australians who care about press freedoms, who care about ending the ongoing political persecution of Julian Assange, to come out and protest when President Biden is here in Australia. Make your voices heard. Make them heard to your members of parliament. And lastly, I would actually like to thank uh, Senator Shoebridge, my colleague, uh, and all the MPs, all 48 of them, who recently signed a joint statement to see the freeing of Julian Assange. And we did a press conference on that here in Australia today. I thank them because we've come a long way from two people five years ago seeking the freedom thank of you, Julian Senator, Assange. Thank you, Senator. Your time has expired. Uh, so the question is that the motion moved by Senator Wish Wilson be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it.